What's good? This is your boy Kelby Cannon, publisher of Making It Magazine, founder of the membership, and we live making it. Um, you know, we, we interview people who moving around, moving and shaking and making it. Um, and today I got Terry Skywalker here with me. My God, I've been seeing this guy around for 17 years. <laughs> Straight up. So here's, here's the thing. I've been fucking with you since I was a rapper. No, no, but see, that's, the, that's the crazy thing. And that's what we can start there. So it's like you 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 are now the owner of this big cultural center in, in the city of Atlanta, like the curator of this thing that that means a lot to a lot of people. One of the owners. One shout out to owners. Flex and Michi. Flex. I don't want to yeah, get yeah. no beef when I get fucked back <laughs> to the office. So, but. For, for, for all intents and purposes, a lot of the face of it. The face. And, and I, now a, that, a, we all agree on. To a large face extent. Of it. So let me, let me correct that. Um, That's like, because I take the smoke. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, whenever we got problems, <laughs> I'll be like, y'all niggas go chill. I'll take the smoke. Yeah. So here's, here's my question for you. I had no idea until I found out. Because, like, I knew you as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I knew of you as an artist. But then, as I'm hearing and seeing and watching, it's like more of a more of a mogul. People, you know, people throw that word around, but like seeing a various entrepreneurial endeavors. It's not just the music. So, can you walk us from from that journey from you doing music to starting to get more on the business side of things? Well, I, I moved to Atlanta to do music. Well, not necessarily to do music. I moved to Atlanta with $150 and three outfits on the run. I'm okay. going to keep it a buck with you. <laughs> like, shit hit the fan in New York. I got into some trouble. I slid out here. My boy that just called me on the phone, um, Max, he moved me out here. He was like, come on, son, jump in the car. And I jumped in the car, asked my mother to borrow $150, and yeah. off to Atlanta I was. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so when I, I initially... Back when I was in New York, I was going to sign to Jay-Z. Okay. Um, he, had, he was about to leave. A lot of niggas don't know this story. He was about to leave Dame Dash in 99 mm -hmm. and start this shit called the Carter Faculty. Okay. I was at the Survival of the Illest concert backstage with Foxy Brown because I went to high school with Inga. And um, one of Jay-Z cousins seen me, but at the time I didn't know he was Jay-Z cousin. He was Eric Sermon, bodyguard. Okay. And he... Um, he just looked at me, and you know, I used to wear the Nordica sweatsuits with the jewelry and the teeth and the earrings. And he was like, yo, you rap? And no, he asked my boy, he said, y'all rap? And my boy was like, I don't rap, but my nigga nice though. No so he was like, kick something, kick something, kick something. I kicked something three times. And he was like, I'm gonna call you, that's my boss. He pointed at Eric Sermon. He said, he looking for artists. And I got back to the dorm room. He actually called um, like a couple days later. And I forgot all about the nigga. You know, dorm, I'm in there drunk, high, I'm in there chilling. And he called. So now he got Eric Sermon on the phone. And he like, kick something, kick something, kick something. Did that. Then he hung up and called me back. And that's when I found out he was Jay-Z cousin. He was like, fuck that nigga. We going to fuck with my cousin. My cousin leaving Dame, starting his own shit. And Teddy Riley was supposed to fund the project. But yeah. you know, at the time, I was in like war in my hood because I had got kicked out of college. Went home and we were selling weed in college. So I had yeah, because nigga, you didn't say nothing about studying in the dorm. I heard that. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm like, honest. He's in the dorm. It's a funny shit. I was an honest student. Okay, I, was, I got my work done, but because I, I naturally can do work. Right. But on the flip side, I was um selling a lot of weed, getting money. So when I finally got kicked out because of my behavior, right. I went back home, fuck around and got robbed. Because I went home with jewelry and Avery, I was getting money. Right. Got robbed. And now I'm at war with the nigga who robbed me. So any day now, I'm either going to die or go to jail. Right. You feel what I'm saying? So when these niggas come with this opportunity, I was like, yes. Like, this shit is like Ricky and Boys in the Hood. I'm right. like, I'm about to make it the fuck out. I just got to stay out the bullshit. And then when he finally came to my house to take us to Virginia, to Teddy Riley house, the nigga said um, Teddy Riley backed out because he had the flu. Mm -hmm. And shit, two days later, I was getting busy and moving to Atlanta. Okay. You feel what I'm saying? And um, yeah, that's how. So when I got out here, 
you know, we was just trapping and keep it real with you, robbing, and we was out here wild on the run. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so I'm out here just wilding, and um, eventually this girl that I was dating told me she was pregnant. Okay. And anybody who knew me since I was a child, I took that kid shit real serious. So that shit made me like change my whole thought process. Mm -hmm. And I went and um, registered to go to Clark Atlanta University. I knew I could get in because I was an honor student at my last school. Them grades follow you. Right. So I went and registered to Clark, got in school. And from there, I just I was already popular when I got in school because I was in the neighborhood for two years. Right. Hustling and wilding. So all the kids knew me. I was their age. So when I finally got in school, I was, I was popular. And I started throwing parties. Okay. You feel what I'm saying? And from there, that's when the entrepreneurship came. I kept throwing parties. Even when I was hustling in the street doing whatever, I always took some extra money and tried to get that party shit off. Okay. You feel what I'm saying? And then right around 2000 and I would like to say 12, maybe. Yeah, my daughter was already born. So she was born in 2012. So 2013, maybe, um, Big Mike that owns Zari Lounge, me and Big Mike started throwing parties together at Simon's, but it was okay. before it was, it was called Time Lounge on Juniper. Okay. You know, Simon is with Porsche and all that shit or whatever on Housewives and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah we was throwing parties at his shit. Okay. And then from there, I opened a photo booth company, started fucking with Bonfire. And then, you know, from being there for a while and getting to upper management, wound up, you know, becoming a, one of the owners. Okay. So... What was the situation with Bonfire? Because, like, murmurs and things that happened at Bonfire. Because I remember my first time going to Bonfire, fuck, it was like a long ass time ago. It was like when it was in the West End. I don't know if that was the first spot. It was like in the West End, nah, it was like a firm. barn type yeah. thing, and then it was just the field, and all the cars was just pulled yeah, up. Yeah, that, that wasn't the first one. That was the second one. That was the second spot? Well, actually, the the way Bonfire started, I wasn't even there, but I've been told this story. Yeah. The way Bonfire started, a bunch of friends wanted to hang out, wanted to kick it, got tired of the, the, the hopping clubs and wanted right. to just do something, you know, regular. And they was going to a field and playing music and it was so much debris in the field that they started burning the motherfucking wood and the shit that was in the field mm -hmm. to get rid of it. But also, you know, it was probably chilly outside. Mm -hmm. And as time passed, you know, it started growing and growing. The need for logistics came. And then the inclination of, you know, we can make money off of this came. I was the first artist to do a takeover at Bonfire. Okay. Yeah, I pulled up with my guy, Absolute, and the DNA family. Um, dopest niggas alive, that's what they stand for. But it was, a, it was literally like 100 of us. Like, literally. And we pulled up deep, and we did our show or whatever. But um, I was hooked on Bonfire from the first time I came. A friend of mine named Jocelyn, that you might know her, she worked at our bar, she a, um, a bartender. Okay. But I was kicking it with her and my other friends, and she was like, meet me at Bonfire. Okay. And that was the first time I ever like came to Bonfire. I loved it, performed at it. Then they closed for a whole year, yeah. and, and they couldn't find a space. And I got cool with the person who at the time was running it. And... um. I became the first cook at Bonfire. I okay. was, yeah, me and my boy Gardy, we was the first people to cook at Bonfire. And then um, then Brothers to Go came with the Caribbean food and mm -hmm. kind of knocked us out the box. Because <laughs> at the time, when we when we started it back up, it was freezing outside. Yeah. It might have been 100 people there. Right. You know what I mean? And it was like that for weeks. But, you know, we all worked at making it better, making it bigger. You know what I mean? At the time, I was just cooking. And then we... Um, it got bigger, and I wound up taking over the Instagram page because I had because I wound up buying a photo booth um, company, and I had the photo booth company, and I was you know making these. I had the first photo booth in the city that I was recording video, okay. like everybody was taking pictures, but you could actually see the experience on the video, and that grew the page from eight hundred to twelve thousand. Right, you feel what I'm saying, and. Long story short, the guy who actually Not had long story long, we got, we yeah, got time. <laughs> the guy, yeah, the guy, the guy who actually had it mm. when he started hanging, he was he was on drugs like mm. cocaine. A lot of them niggas is on coke, but he was on it really like on it on it, 
And when he got started hanging with me, because I, I smoke, I used to smoke weed. I don't even smoke no more. Uh -huh. I eat edibles, but I don't like the, the smoke shit no more. But he was like, y'all can't be around. At the time, I wasn't smoking, come to think of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't drink. It's been nine years since I drank. Okay. So at the time, he was like, yo, I can't be around you and be comfortable being on drugs and being. So I watched this nigga detox and like go through withdrawal and all that shit. And he wound up getting back on and shit mm -hmm. later. And it, and it got worse, you feel right. what I'm saying? So he was firing motherfuckers, cursing out large brands like Red Bull and um, MTV and um, One Music Fest and mm -hmm. shit like that. And basically, me and him fell out. And once we fell out, just so happened, the owner of that space, Asa, who owns Apache Cafe, yeah. came to me and was like, yo, I don't want to talk to him no more because he's disrespectful. Cause he was right. doing that shit with everybody. He was like, if somebody don't take this shit over, then I'm gonna cancel the whole shit. Okay. And at the time we had like Is this the where it was in the, that was the, in the other spot? Yeah, yeah, the other spot. Yeah. And at the time we had like 25 motherfuckers that was working for Bonfire. Right. You know what I mean? And niggas was actually dependent on that check yeah. every week. So my partners now went to him and told him, like, look, we about to take it over, but we not gonna leave you out. He was only getting 33%, so we was going to give him 25% just to stay home. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? He didn't have to come just to not piss off the owner and fuck us up. Right. And he agreed, but then he tried to go behind our back and do some other shit, and that's where we got to where he wasn't around no more. Okay. You know what I mean? And it was just kind of weird because he got on Instagram and was talking about, you know, the crew was called DBSC, and he was like, DBSC is no longer involved. But literally yeah. everybody stayed. The only only two people left. Him and a friend of his who left. Okay. You know what I mean? And the friend could have stayed. He just wanted to host. But at the time, I didn't feel like he was a good host. Like I watched this nigga not host good for four years. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? So it wasn't no beef. We was actually right. gonna let him come in and do his thing, make right. his little money. But he just didn't want him to host. But then he got upset, and you know, then we wound up moving around a lot because basically what happened was um right when we took over we started getting better acts right. so the first act we had was bob okay yeah you know i mean um former another former partner of ours he booked bob then bob wanted to do his album release party there a few months later so he brought bob and ti and ti brought tiny trader truth usher a couple other people and that's when Bonfire started really getting like his notoriety and right. shit. Anyway, um, then Kiki Palmer popped out. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she came in a hoodie and shit and was low key. And she was like, yo, I want to perform next week. She told my partner Flex that. And next week she came and performed. But the problem was somebody was calling the police on us right around this time. Mm -hmm. So the police was like, at the time we had outside speakers and they was like, yo, any amplified noise, we gonna lock y'all up and shut y'all down. And that's when the headphones came into play. Uh, they came back the next okay. week. They came back the next week and we could not let Kiki Palmer yeah. fucking perform. Yeah. So they came back the next week and we had 1,500 headphones outside. Okay. And they was pissed off. There was really nothing they could do. But they really was mad because of the car break-ins. At that time, it was a lot of car break-ins and shit. And um, yeah, at the time, it was a lot of car break-ins and shit. And we basically raised the crime rate for the whole city of Atlanta in one night. Mm -hmm. It would be 50 car break-ins in one night. So the captain was trying to shut us the fuck down. She was like adamant about that shit. Now, the interesting thing is that that's not really addressing the problem. Is like bonfire created an opportunity because all these cars mm -hmm. in a place, but it's not responsible for the crime. So yeah. why would you? That's like you don't you don't but shut you know, them all down when you're doing <laughs> when you're doing um, parties. They are a little harder on you, mm -hmm. club owners and shit like that. Because it's weird because it's like Atlanta say they want business, but they. They will shut your shit down, and I, I can't even tell you why. Like Peter Street, for 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 example, mm -hmm. you got this place where 
all of these restaurants, bars, and clubs was at. Then you get the gentrification is really, I guess it's gentrification because then you get the, the gentrifiers moving in. You don't want to say no special nationality or, mm-hmm. or race or whatever, but you get the gentrifiers moving in and they start to complaining about shit that's been existing before they moved there. Right. And then like the crazy shit, like on Peter Street, they was putting out fucking roadblocks mm-hmm. right outside these bars, you know what I mean, on purpose. Right. But to scare motherfuckers away, they kept threatening to shut shit down. Like even yeah. with with eleven forty five, when they put out that statement, right? I felt that shit. Yeah. Like I know Manny and them and, and DJ. You know what I mean? I'm real cool with Manny. Not so much DJ. We I. Right, but you know we go through the same shit. You get right. these when you go to these NPU meetings, and for those of you who don't know what NPU meeting is called, a neighborhood planning unit. And that's basically the people who's responsible. It's like a neighborhood watch or whatever. They're responsible for everything that go on in the neighborhood. Right. They're the ones who vote on permits, on events, on everything. We on Bankhead. You go to Bankhead fucking NPU, it's all white people. Right. You feel what I'm saying? That sounds. That sounds. That sounds. That sounds counterintuitive. Like that's okay. yeah. that's a- it's all white people. <laughs> So they making these decisions on what go here and what go there. They the ones calling the city. They the ones calling the police. And that's really not their fault. It's because we don't go to this shit. Right. If we we showed up and actually like, yo, we want a voice in this shit, they ain't got no choice. Right. You know what I mean? But we don't show up. So, yeah, that's what really goes on. So they they try to shut shit down. And it's really because of the complaints and noise complaints and shit like that. And, you know, it is what it is. Like One of the things that I always found um, particularly interesting about Bonfire is that it's like, it's kind of this cross-section of Atlanta. Like, you get you get the streets, but then you get, like, the, the bougier aspects and the hipster vibes. Like, it's like all of these things all in one. It, it kind of, it feels like it, it Bonfire kind of, like, when they when Edgewood disappeared. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like the soul of Edgewood travels with bonfire. To well, be honest with you, the, the, the people the people who had it before us, even us with, you mm-hmm. know, being engaged in the event, bonfire really comes from MJQ and Edgewood. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? It's the same people, same crew, whatever. It's just a, another version of MJQ and um, department store. Right. You feel what I'm saying? And, you know, is it, is basically, I would like to say, they are the catalyst for each other. Like, at one point, MJQ was fueled by everything Bonfire. And Bonfire has, most a lot of our patrons frequent MJQ, especially on Wednesday and Saturday. Mm-hmm. Same thing with department store. Everybody from department store also used to go to Bonfire. So you write about that, like, yeah, it's the soul. The soul of Edgewood lives in Bonfire. And Arbaugh. Mm-hmm. Even though yeah. the owner of Arbaugh don't fuck with me, I will say that they are a staple in the city based off of the people from Department Store, the people from Edgewood, which built that particular culture. That's where they dwell during the week. Mm. So when it comes to, like, doing this and the performances what is the what's the process of like how do y'all go about selecting the artist but that's it all me okay that's it all me because I, like i said I, do, I dealt in music for so long yeah. and then my wife's sister is the lead singer of the country music group sugarland okay which so they sold 30 million plus records you feel what i'm saying so i was around this music shit i've been with my wife for 20 years okay. 10 married 10 you know what i mean um just dating and her, um, I knew her sister since she had her first single. You feel what I'm saying? And now she's this mega superstar. And I met a lot of people along the way, musicians and, you know, like Jan Smith is her vocal coach, the, okay. the big vocal coach that do Usher and everybody else. Yeah. And through that, I knew that I could basically revamp Bonfire Stage. Because at the time when I came in, it was all trap rap and, you know, shit like that. And I just, my whole shit was I told the guy, I was like, look, 
I can bring you bands, I can bring you vocalists, I could bring, I could switch up your shit and make it more cultural. Yeah, that, that's what one of the things that I like I found interesting was like when um one of the times it was like it was like com I normally I don't get there that early. And I get there and it was like it was like comedy. Like, mm -hmm. it's like and so I was like, oh, this is different. Like, and then we stuck like man, and then we stuck around to like to the end, like I was supposed to been out of there, but <laughs> but it's just like you get caught yeah, see, up in the. But that see, for all you promoters out there, that's what really makes bonfire. The amount of things that we do to keep motherfuckers from having idle minds, because mm -hmm. you know idle minds do the devil work. Right. You feel what I'm saying? So a nigga standing around on a couch. Drinking and chilling and looking at other people who eventually get restless and say the wrong thing to the wrong girl or her mm. boyfriend say something or they, they, they bump each other and it's going to turn into something or whatever. You walk in by fire, first thing you're going to see is the silent headphones. Right. You're like, what the hell is those? Mm -mm. Then you're going to see the fire pit. Like, oh, these niggas really got a fire. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to see the people and start looking at the girls and stuff like that. We do 65% women. Then you're going to come inside and you're going to see the comedy and you're going to see the basketball hoop and the skate ramp and the blah, 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 blah. Right. But by the time you finish looking at shit, yeah. it's time to go. Yeah. Ain't even no idle mind, no time to be idle or do no bullshit. That's why we have never had the police call when it come to the actual event, mm. period. Really, yeah, yeah, when it come to the event. Like, we had niggas call on noise and shit like that, but, like, niggas getting beat up or fighting or shooting or shit like that. We ain't had 11 years, and that's why we able to operate the way we do. Because the city actually fuck with us. It's just they, they don't know how. Right. Because we in this gray area type yeah. shit. And that, and that's that kind of when you was talking about the NPU and just all that. That's what like um, like how that makeup of that that body is different from the community that is in and different mm -hmm. from the event and just like a lot of the stuff that as um, on the on the on the promoter and club owner venue owner situation um, how there's this thing with that and it, and it made me made me ask myself like. Is that a thing for just club owners and events in general? No, it's everybody. Is, yeah. If you, no matter what, it, it, well, it depends. If I'm mm -hmm. opening a business, right. I don't have to go to the NPU to open a beauty salon. Right. You feel what I'm saying? But yeah, if you want to, if you want to, if you are in, in um, market or in a profession that needs permitting mm -hmm. or licensing, yeah, that's no matter what. I mean, if you, if you need a permit or a license, you're going to have to go fuck with the NPU. And you're going to have to sit there and kick it to them. And you're going to get this old white man asking these questions about that he don't even know what the fuck going on. But, you know what I mean? You're going to get a house mom talking about shit she don't know what she talking about. Uh, right. yeah, that's what you get. All right. So, in an alternate timeline, you were assigned to Jay-Z. The alternate timeline. I was alternate timeline. Alternate timeline. I was about to be, be on Rockefeller. <laughs> rock, Not rock, even Rock, rock Nation. Rock, Rockefeller. That walk was old. Me down that path. What would have, what would have been the name of your first project? I couldn't tell you. I was in a whole different space. I know. I was in a whole different space. I could rap my ass off though back then. And I've heard you. Like I Boy, remember back at, then. We we, was, we uh, hopped in the car. I think we was over at Union, and you was playing me some shit. Did you ever release any of that? Mm -mm. Rest in peace, Clay. Mm. Yeah, rest in peace, Clay. I met Clay before Clay was messing with T.I. Really? Met, yeah, I met Clay. He was a club promoter. Mm -hmm. He's promoting some club on the north side. And I used to go out every night. And I'd run into Clay at his spot. And Clay would, would what you call that, bet against other niggas rapping, battling me. Mm -hmm. He used to make me battle niggas and, and make money off of that. <laughs> so did Killer Mike mm -hmm. on Clark Campus. Killer Mike used to come up there, grab me to battle niggas. He even told me one time, he was like, yo, if I, I'm going through this shit with outcasts, but if I have my own money, boy, I'll come get you. Da -da 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 -da. Mike know what it is. <laughs> it's straight up. There's a lot of niggas don't want nothing with me. To this day, niggas don't want nothing with me on that mic, boy. Because, yeah. you know, he experiences is what sculpture supposed to sculpture music. Right. You know what I mean? These young kids don't really get it. 
And that's why they shit not really resonating like that. Like, you make a hit, but then you don't see them no more. Right. You feel what I'm saying? And shit like that. Because they don't know how to, like, put themselves in their music. Fast food. Yeah. It's like... Yeah, it's just it like... It tastes good. It's sugary, it's salty, whatever, but it don't stick to your bones. It ain't got them nutrients. Yeah, like because what, what artists don't understand is... If you put out music and you know you put some soul into it, it's about what you going through or what you've been through, shit like that. If when you do that, then it's people that's that's going through the same shit, mm-hmm. or it's people that wonder what going through that shit is like. Yeah. You know what I mean? But if you come out and you fronting, mm-hmm. that, I like to tell people there's a difference between Whitney Houston and Mary J. Mm-hmm. Whitney Houston was dugged out from the time she ever came out. Mm-hmm. She was smoking and all that. Nobody mm-hmm. knew that. Many of not been fucking with the crack and all that shit. Mm-hmm. But they made her to be this princess. Right. And after a while, people started seeing the real Whitney, mm-hmm. and they turned on her. Right. Mary J came out. Mary J was feed out. Mm-hmm. Mary J was on super coat, mad skinny, on stage with the dark glasses and looking crazy, fucking with um, KC. You know KC was out here feed out. Mm-hmm. And we watched her grow up. Right. And she told us what she was going through the whole time she was growing up. Right. You feel what I'm saying? So that's the difference. Right now, Mary J could fuck around and put out an album. She going to go double platinum. Right. Because she got them loyal fans that fucking watched her grow and appreciated her struggle. You know what I mean? So I tell a lot of these artists that shit right now. Like, at the end of the day, put your soul into your music. You know, really start thinking about the name of your, like my homegirl came to me, she was like, yo, what should I name my album? And I was like, well, you're gay, and you're, you're, you're dressed like a boy, but you're still girly, you're Filipino and black, you, you look, your face is straight Filipino, but your skin tone is, is like mixed between brown and, you know, mm-hmm. the Filipino complexion. I was like, you're undefined. Mm-hmm. That's the name of your album. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Undefined. Like when we start, when you do shit like that, now she can sculpt her album. Right. Now she can say, "All right, this is the project I want on my album. Let me make a song about this. Let me make a song about that." Because you have a title, you know the concept of your album. You make songs to fit that concept. Right. You know what I mean? I think that, and like going into that is like. Um, Youth, like I remember last year, I was um, like just talking about older artists and like this 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 infatuation everybody has with youth. And we did a whole episode of the podcast with my co-host. She just turned thirty. Mm-hmm. She was like, "Oh, I'm turning thirty. It's like, what the fuck does that mean?" Like, and it's just like, but it's just like the amount of artists that I run into because a lot of what I do is damn near, you know, like. Uh, community service and just talking to the artists like mm-hmm. about real life shit and it's like what that is like this I have to be on by this age I can't like I had I had a I had a um, an artist that we had booked on the show to perform and um, and so the way we do it they submit through the site and the reason why we do it like that is so that when you get picked it ain't it's like to reinforce that you dope yeah not that you pay for this thing and you. It's like, yo, it's real. even the way that I work, I <coughs> never say you won. Yeah. It's like you were selected. Mm-hmm. And so we used to have it where when we would send the email announcement out and it'd be a button for people to find out who won, they had to click it and it would po- populate a tweet mm-hmm. with the person tagged in it and everybody just That's like, lit. congratulation, bomber. Uh-huh. And so he's from up top too. So he performed, he had a good time. We outside the old Apache. And he's like, bro, I ain't even gonna lie to you. I saw him the first person, like, congratulate, like, ha ha, you know, I'm from a, like, I, niggas don't be congratulating people like that. I was like, and then he was like, and then I kept seeing him. I was like, bro, this is like, you don't even know what that means to me, because, like, bro, I be feeling like I'm washed. Like, you know, I see all these young out here rapping and da 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 da. And I'm like, I'm looking at him. I'm like 30 something at the time, right? And I'm like, how old are you? He's like, yeah, bro, I'm 26. And I'm like, what the? <laughs> Let me tell you something, man. We do this to ourselves. <laughs> yeah. As African Americans, it's like we always pigeonhole each other. Mm-hmm. It's like, you country artists right now, 
is still making music. Mm -hmm. New country artists coming out, old as fuck. Mm -hmm. Like, straight up and down. You got new R&B artists coming out, old as fuck. You go to them stations on, like, The Heat and shit like that mm -hmm. on um, Sirius. You're going to hear shit you never heard before from old-ass artists doing R&B, or really the R&B one right next to The Heat. I forgot what his name. But, yeah, you're going you're gonna to hear that shit. Only in hip-hop, young black people, do we try to say, yo, somebody's too old to do their art. Right. Like, that's like telling a nigga, yo, you too old to paint, nigga. Yeah. This shit is art. You're an artist. It is, yeah. like, literally from your soul, from your spirit. Like, you shouldn't, nobody should tell you you too old. I think that's what the problem is, is too many hustlers in the game. But, but I say this much. I wouldn't say it's too many hustlers. I would say that these hustlers don't know how to do art. Because there's hustlers, it. like, hustlers that know I'm how to do I'm not knocking an artist who has hustle. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm knocking a hustler who has no Who just got in the... Like, but you know where that come from? It's just about making money. Yeah, I come from... You know, I am... Um, I don't know if you've seen me when I got on stage and I had that little quarrel or little saying with um, Bishop. Oh, yeah. I was going to get to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so we can go ahead. So, so yeah, right. I mean, um, what's the name of this platform again? ATL Top 20. ATL Top 20, yeah. The reason why I got so mad at that platform or that, that particular time is because the whole show was about artists and um, DJs. Mm -hmm. And it was about DJs, you know, charging the artist too much money and the artist not willing to pay. And they, they really, I didn't like how they was trying to put it all on the artist. Like, you know, you got to spend that money. Nigga, niggas out here to make money. You know what I mean? And, da -da 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 -da. and they came on from that angle. And I got up there and I told them, I said, bro, I'm going to keep it real with you. Go find five artists. And I, I used Cliff as an actual reference. He was in there. Mm -hmm. I said, he went to, with his team and they went and booked the show. And they booked the other artists. And the other artists had fans. And their fans showed up. And their fans and their fans. And now you got a room full of fans that's not yours that you can make your fans. Right. And you can keep doing that and keep building a buzz. Because I promise you, once you start buzzing, the same DJ that wanted money going to be on your dick. Yeah. And that's just straight up and down. I was like, it's going to start with the DJ. It's going to end with the DJ. But DJs cut it out because y'all fucking the music up. Mm. Because y'all taking money. And that's all y'all doing. And, oh, and who got the money? Just some strong drug dealers, I'm street shoot, niggas, or rich motherfuckers. I'm going to shoot some bail to the DJs. I, I made a post about this maybe about, I don't know, maybe a couple weeks ago. But it's like, the DJ gets paid by the club owner or the promoter mm -hmm. to play the music. That they want to hear. That the people want to hear. Yeah. And it's like, when artists want the DJ to play their music, they're not asking them to DJ. They're asking them to be a record promoter at that time. Mm -hmm. And so in that, that is a service. But I'm not mad. Yeah. Get your money. Right. Yes, charge people. Mm -hmm. But every once in a while, get the kid that you know no, really no, got I, talent. We, we back on that. That's, yeah. But see, that's my thing. That's breaking a record. Yeah. Like for me, I, my personal take, you can't say you broke a record if you got paid for it. You can't. Like the budget broke it. Because if it wasn't you, it would have been someone else. Yeah. Like, breaking a record is standing on your ear and your skill set and knowing what the crowd's going to like and introducing it to them. I don't care if it's if it, if it it's it's a hole in the wild club that only hold 80 people or a coliseum. It's like you stood on it and you, you, you broke the record to this audience. But when someone already got $100,000 behind it, it's going to do what it do. You just, you just fill in the seat. Like, uh, like I said, I grew up, my best friend brother was Russell Simmons had bodyguard. Mm -hmm. So I grew up around this shit and in this shit. And I watched DJs, Funkmaster Flex and Stretch and Barbito and mm -hmm. all these other DJs break motherfuckers. Right. So I'm talking to my homeboy. One of my best friends is a DJ on one of the major stations out here. I ain't going to throw him under the bus. But he like, yo, that ain't how I work no more. You, we, you know, oh, we, don't, we can't break all this because, you know, the programming and this and that. And I'm like, nigga. You on the radio eight times a week, seven days, two times on one of those days. All of these young DJs is on your dick, mm -hmm. point blank period. You can easily just bring that shit to a club, whatever, 
send that shit out in a blast to the younger DJs. Mm. Like, you got more power than you lead on. And, you yo, don't get mad when the shit blow and you sitting there looking stupid because a nigga sitting on millions without your help and now you not getting none of this shit. But... I'll give it, go back to this. And this I'm only saying this because that's my no, own boy. I, no, I yeah, that's my boy. And, like, and this, I'll go back to this, but the reason why I feel like a lot of DJs feel the way that they feel is because they've helped, like, I ain't going to say all of them, but enough have helped people with, without getting anything out of it. Because, like, people... I tried this, to get this nigga back. I tried to get his... I literally... This nigga is on my registration as owning part of the label. Mm-hmm. Him and my attorney. Mm-hmm. I put them both on the label to give him incentive to break the shit. Mm-hmm. And the nigga still won't break it. And the crazy shit is, he loved the music. Mm-hmm. Loved the music. Like, I know for a fact, like, the niggas that I got, I got them because I loved the music. Right. Like, I'm like, these was niggas who come into our showcase all the time. Shout out to One Moon, Moon and Uno. Um, Rapping Moon the Great. Nigga. Like, yeah. I, I, saw the, I'm a, I just met them Sunday. Yeah, they performed. And so I Sunday. saw them. I saw them perform, and I was I was fucking with them. I'm like, you rapping ass yep. nigga. Like, yeah, he's rapping. They ain't some rapping <laughs> ass niggas. And and the nigga with the melody is a melody ass, <laughs> control the crowd ass yeah. nigga. These niggas is really good. And they were solo artists. They came to me with a project, and they did together. And I was at the time I was looking for girls because girls is the wave. And I'm like, right. yo, we got this label, got this distribution deal with Pesh over at um Live, Live Mixtapes. Mix and I'm like, yo, I wanna. Fuck with it, so I'm gonna get the girls. Cause I was like, basically, Atlanta is in jail. Right. All the rappers from Atlanta that was popping is in jail. I was like, it either, I was like, it's two places where it's going the girls and the Memphis. Mm-hmm. That's it. If you ain't got an artist from Memphis or you ain't got a female, like, straight up. And it's convenient if you're a female from Memphis. <laughs> Glorilla. So I sat there and was like, yo, you know what? This art, this shit is dope. Right. If y'all could bring me another album that hasn't been put out yet, I'll fuck with it. You feel what I'm saying? Because I know our marketing ability, you know, we got we 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 actually touch bodies, pause. Right. You know what I mean? We actually get, bring 1,500 people to a venue. Like, a lot of these motherfuckers can't do that. Right. They got digital platforms and all that. But actually saying, come outside and niggas pull up, yeah. that's special. So yeah. I'm like, I'm going to break these niggas. Did a quarter million spins in like two months. Like, real spins. Not no buying, paying niggas to pitch at the playlist. Right. You feel what I'm saying? And getting the playlist. If an artist, y'all don't know, the only way you're going to get love right now as an independent artist when it comes to Spotify and all that shit is to get your shit on playlist. Mm-hmm. And it's not that hard. You go to shit like Fiverr and all that, and you find niggas, and you pay them to pitch it to the playlist. I got a nigga pitch the 10,000 playlists, click of a button. And you never know who's going to bite. Right now, we're on 2,500 playlists. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? They, some, some of them is real small. Yeah. Some of them got 30,000 members, some shit like that. But that is the grind that we, that, we, that we put on. I put these artists out. I got a bunch of more artists coming now that's about to come out. But it, ain't, it don't take you nothing. DJs, y'all responsible for the content that's out right now. This is the bottom line. It's y'all. Because y'all really still control shit. But the labels got y'all like this. And y'all only paying what they pay, playing what they pay for. But really, y'all could decide what the fuck y'all want to play. I'ma shoot, I'ma shoot DJs bail. Yeah. Hey. Cause they ain't a lot of DJs ain't getting paid. Like this the same shit that's going on with the music is going on with the DJs. Cause it's like it's it's so many people that are hung like this, like, all right, so generations. They got wealthy mm-hmm. helping these people get rich. They got rich helping these people get exposure. And like, and that's where we at. We at the exposure clout generation where it's like, yo, I pay the DJ. Like, I pay, like, so the person who actually does this, who doing all the other stuff to a lot of like when it when we just looking at the numbers and not the impact of the culture, you got people who gonna get rid of the the seasoned DJ who know really and just put somebody in there just to who gonna DJ for like a $75 ball. Yeah, you're time. right. And so it's a lot of DJs trying to figure it out. And I think it was a lot more, I think it's a lot more now post COVID because they saw how tenuous things was and they saw that nobody really gave a fuck COVID. Like, cause I remember I made a post, like I made a post on my page and I'm like, yo, right now, 
like all these DJs then then lost gigs jobs. Like the same DJ you was trying to get to play your music last week, then they got time right now. Like inbox them, ask them for their cash app, shoot them five dollars their cash app just to get their opinion, your opinion on their music. And it was like they the artist was going crazy. And it's people with real problems. There's real people out here. Da, 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 da. Like the artists don't treat the DJs like real people a lot of the times. Yeah. So that's what they run into. So it's like everybody is like talking about the worst experience. Like we're speaking to our worst experience. So you speaking to the worst experience with the DJs and the DJs are speaking to the oh, worst no, I, experience. One with thing the I can say, I book not you specifically. Yeah, I artists. book three DJs a week. And mm -hmm. I and I love the DJs. But you know, it has to come a time where you take some kind of accountability, bro. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you know, it ain't just the DJs now because you got TikTok and all that other shit. But regardless of the fact, if you a nigga, a DJ that, that been doing this and you like good music, how are you comfortable playing the shit that you playing? You feel what I'm saying? Like the, the, the older DJs that been around that, like, come on, bro. It don't take nothing to play a nigga song, yo. It really don't. Like, if you like it. Right. I ain't saying play anybody shit. Right. But if you take the time, man, like, I let me... I'm busy as fuck. I got barbershop, studios, all types of shit, bonfire, fucking Toro, Airbnbs. I'm doing all types of shit. Right. And I'm doing all that shit myself. I ain't got no assistant, nothing. I got Airbnb. I'm cleaning them fucking houses with my wife. You feel what I'm saying? I got Toro. I'm taking that shit to the car wash myself. Shit like that. And I listen to nigga shit. Right. Like, just to not be disrespectful. Yeah. You know, niggas send me they shit. And if I say I'm going to listen to it, and I might forget but then if nigga text me, like, son, you ever listen to that? I'm in the car. Yeah. It takes nothing for me to pull up Spotify and ride to that for 15 minutes. Yeah. Shit trash, turn it off. Shit good, next, next, yeah. next. Nigga see me again, I know the words to his shit. Just out of, damn, son, you really know my shit? Yeah, nigga. Because I'm really fucking with y'all. I'm not here to just try to take y'all money at my party. Right. Bonfire is more than just, yo, pay us to get in on fucking Sunday. No, we book these indie artists. I'm on Instagram. We do a showcase, and I get some people. But a lot of times, I'm on Instagram going into niggas' profiles, going into their Spotify, um, um, Apple, whatever they got down there, the, the, the flow, flow code. I press the button. I'm listening to niggas' shit. I'm listening. I'm looking for a band. I'm, I'm putting in live bands, ATL, or band ATL in the hashtag. I'm listening to niggas' shit. Mm. And that's just straight up. Niggas acting like they too good. You want to sit there and listen to the same shit all day with all this new music floating around. Like, that shit crazy. So, and, so that's an interesting, like, it gives me an interesting thought. Like, because I don't, like, every DJ not an artist. And it's like, that's, but even, even is like how as an artist, I love a good beat, and I'm gonna rap over a good beat. But nigga, I can't sit down and just put beats together. <laughs> like, like I can't do this production shit. I be watching like, like bro, the nigga, first I've been was good. Like, I've been rapping. <laughs> I'm 44. I've been rapping since I was nine. That's 35 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to turn shit on. <laughs> Cause as soon as the nigga play the first part of the beat, the I'm rapping. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't never look at the shit to see what he was doing. I'm like, nigga, when he, when he, when he, like straight up off right. the rip. And that so that and that go back to like for me, there are two different type of DJs. There's the DJ who is it's about the crowd. Like they like just blending and the shit that they and controlling the crowd and doing all that type shit. They love the art of DJing as a as a technical skill and the rapport with the crowd. And then I think there's this other DJ that we're speaking to who is more ingrained of it, with it being a part of the culture that loves to break new music. That is also an artist that lo that loves that aspect of it. Because I be like... Them scratching DJs yeah. like to break music. Right. Them niggas, them niggas who really you know, DJ. That, I'm talking about... I'm with you on that. Them, but the ones who are more about the just the interaction with the what they getting from the crowd. Yeah. And not being that, not what the, they're giving to the crowd. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's a relationship where the DJ, they just... They're just playing to get the reaction. And then there are the other DJs 
who play, who want to push, who want to control the crowd. Like, yo, when I drop this shit, they ain't never heard this shit, and I'm going to make these motherfuckers love this shit. I'm going to make these motherfuckers talk about some Mook. shit. Mook is Mook one, is of, one of them. Mook is one of them. Mook, Mook is definitely Mook, one of them. Mook, well, when, I, when, I, when we went to the crew Mook, lounge. Mook spent eight nights a week. <laughs> when Mook, when we went to the crew lounge, and Mook was, was tasked with pushing my artist shit, I've never had a DJ do it like that. Mm. Like he know he made that shit sound like that shit been on the radio for yeah. fucking ten years already. Like it was a classic. Right. Like he was bringing it back, putting the horns, putting the fade to it, the yeah. echo to it. I'm like, that's how you break a record. You yeah. make niggas remember that record, bro. Like, but these niggas don't got the technical skills. So it really ain't. The, it really ain't their fault. It's the fault of those who. Allow these niggas to just jump in the game because they got a laptop and a fucking digital board. Like that, like, bro, you can't come from the park and go to the NBA. Right. That's just straight up. And and that's what's going on with music. That's what's going on with DJing right now. I blame to my personal thing, I blame the DIY mentality. Just period for all this shit. Like, it's like, it's a reason we I feel like I was just talking to someone about this. We ain't never going to challenge a, a, a Mark Zuckerberg or anything. Like, we're never going to challenge Universal Records because them is companies and it requires people and stuff like that. And it's like, in this music space and just in general, like more even entrepreneur, everybody's been sold. You can do it yourself. You don't need nobody else. And it's like, you can, but you can only do it so far by yourself. And so it's like every, like, I can just get Serato and now I DJ. So, like, niggas didn't come up carrying crates, having to be the warm up DJ, I was having to be. Them crates, like, bro. like, bro, when I was a rapper, bro, I'd get to the club early. I'm helping bring equipment in. I'm talking, I'm buying drinks. Like, uh, My best like, friend was a DJ. Yeah. So, I was, he was stretched. I was Bobito. Okay. I was the nigga on the mic hosting. Mm -hmm. He was the nigga DJing. I used to carry them crates and shit like that. But see, I think it, I, when I was growing up, that laptop light, bro. Don't don't need your help. That no shit more. ain't yeah. <laughs> they got a big bag, bag on. for you, sir. Like, <laughs> see what niggas don't understand is when I was a kid, um, growing up, because we was I told you I was rapping since I was nine. Yeah. The rap that exists now existed. Yeah. But niggas was getting like beat the fuck up. Like you can't get in the cipher. And I'm in the ops, and I'm in the cops, and niggas gonna beat you the fuck up. Like, yeah. nigga, what you doing in this cypher if you ain't sit down and actually put your shit together? But that's the need for gatekeepers. Like, and that's the, like, everybody, like, everybody, no, nobody likes gatekeepers. And it's like, nobody like club security until a nigga got a pole in the fucking club. Like, then it was like, why didn't y'all check him? Like, so it's like. You was a bitch ass security <laughs> until that nigga motherfucking was about to slice my face. Yeah. And now I need you to come. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, so, and, and so, like, that's the thing with it, with the DJs and with a lot of the people, like, with the industry. Like, bro, like, if, it, if it's gatekeepers, only so many can get in. And, like, that just means you gotta be better. You gotta stand. Like, the see, old industry used to have to convince somebody. Somebody that you was yeah. dope. A nigga had to hear your shit. That's what I'm about to say. Now you gotta kick some. Everybody. Remember that? <laughs> kick some. Yeah. Kick some. Now, I'm, nigga, I'm sitting there rapping for my life, nigga. Yeah. I'm just, you know, all my best bars. You don't got that no more. Motherfuckers just wake up. How long, nigga? Yo, I'm out. I'm about, I'm about to drop. Nigga, I'm on Def Jam. How long you been rapping? Two months. Yeah. Like, for real? Like, yeah, because the nigga sold drugs, paid for a nigga to play his shit. That one single hit, you're going to put them on. Like, I'll give you a prime example. I hate to say that because this is one of my homeboys. Bobby Schmurder. Mm -hmm. You know, niggas, niggas forced that single through because it was catching a buzz. Mm -hmm. Oh, we going to sign him? And what else? Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Like, it's just, I, I grew up with, yo, when I was 16, a nigga that I rapped with, 16-year-old said, a blind man's plans don't always coincide with his hands. So I value my senses more than 50 acres of land. Mm -hmm. Like, nigga, I never will forget that bar. Mm -hmm. This is a 16-year-old kid said right. that. Right. That's what 16-year-olds was rapping like when I was growing up. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Like, but that is like that's what we what what doesn't get measured doesn't get improved. You st we studied rap. We quit measuring rap. Yeah. It's like 
it's always it come back down to, well, how much did he sell? Like the nigga who always introduced that when we talking about the top five, top ten, it was like he ain't sold more, but she ain't sell more, and then it's like, well, then nigga, we ain't gotta have a talk then. We can just look at the same. Niggas used to wanna say, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> it was like a nigga said some shit that like how he put that together. Yeah. Like, like, like Jay-Z, what Jay-Z said back, he said, nigga, get fly. Let him defy gravity. Mm. Four five rapidly lift his chest cavity. <laughs> nigga, that's like what? Like, listen, like nigga, I heard that all the time. I was God, listen, oh, so on some random shit. I'm on live and I'm listening to submissions, and it's like it'd be like, like me and my one of my producers was having that conversation. It's like the wit left rap. Like it ain't a lot of shit ain't witty no more. It's just. As I said exactly what I said. I pin the block on my op. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck the cops. <laughs> but it's like, he got shot. I'm trying to decide if I should get a nine, a five, or a nine. Like, and I was just like, very simple. But it's like, it's like, that, like, and that was witty for me. Like, that's where the bar is. Like, it's like, it ain't like I bear arms like short sleeve shirts. Like, it ain't, it, it's not layered. And so when we see Kendrick and and Drake engaging in this battle is like kind of- Both like, of them niggas were speaking bars. Yeah. No matter if you think oh, yeah, Drake- we definitely got to get back to this. Because you had some outlandish taste on my- <laughs> Nah, son, you know, why I, you know why I got like that? I have a mixed child. Right. And I'm, and I'm educated. Right. You know what I mean? A historian, if you, if, if you could say, based off of me taking history class for so long right. and understand. Back when slavery was a thing, I thought you was about to do Kendrick's third verse. Mm -mm. <laughs> back, back in the days, when we were nah, <laughs> back, 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 back when slavery was a thing, mm -hmm. the slave masters would rape the slave women, right? And they would have illegitimate children mm -hmm. that they never said was their kid. That they would leave in that motherfucking plantation right. to be raised as a slave, yeah. and he was called a nigger. Right. He answered to nigga. Mm -hmm. He was whipped, beat like everybody else. Mm -hmm. He was lighter than everybody else. Yeah. When did light skin mixed kids not be black? Mm -hmm. And that's that's what got me mad because people don't understand the effect that celebrity has on the real world. Yeah. I have an 11-year-old child that has to now go to school, and because her parents is in the house, talk, the, the other guy's parents is in the house talking crazy, yeah. he's telling my daughter, you ain't black. Right. My daughter lives with me. Yeah. Even if she was adopted and was 100% white, mm -hmm. trust me. <laughs> that I'm is out, the point. Yeah, I'm outside. No, no, I, no. I, I'm outside. <laughs> I moved here on the run. I put in super work in all these hoods in Atlanta. These, my name rang bells before bonfire. Right. You feel what I'm saying? So how you going to tell my daughter right. that literally is me? She is just like me. Okay. Talk okay. like me, act like me, move like me. She is me. How, and she's mixed. How you going to sit there and tell her she ain't black? Because you it fits your narrative at the time. Yeah. You know? Nobody told Malcolm X he wasn't black. Yeah. Nobody told Colin Kaepernick he wasn't black. Nobody told his his, his and I get what they say no, about Drake no, no, and the no, culture. No, no, no. Here's, a, here's the thing, bro. I'm going to I gotta go get this copy of this magazine that we put Drake on the cover of. Mm -hmm. Let me see what y'all niggas over there talking about while he doing that. Okay, we wilding. These two issues. Mm -hmm. This is the beef. Right? Drake, hip hop's Obama. Like the, the opening, opening lines on this thing. A light skinned African American with no Negro dialect unless he wanted to have one. These were the er words echoing from CNN as I sat down to work on our Drake cover story. It was Monday morning. The news had just broken about comments that Senator Harry Reid made during the 20, 2008 Democratic primaries describing Barack Obama. A light-skinned Negro with no, light-skinned African-American with no Negro dialect. And so like the whole thing with Drake and was like, for me and my observation, I don't know, but it's like Drake code switches. He speaks at home 
like we speak at work and he speaks at work like we speak at home. So it's like, it's a reverse Which is my question. Who the fuck don't do that? No, no, no. That's what I'm saying. When I get in the office, (laughs) it it depends on what meeting I'm at. Uh If I'm at a meeting where everybody in that meeting is there because I am there and they want want something from me, I'm going to be my motherfucking self. Right. If I'm in a meeting where I need something from this motherfucker, right. I'm gonna be a little less me. And that's and that's the point. I think that's the point is his his himself is how we act in the office. Mm-hmm. And when he comes in to work in hip hop, that's him not but being see, a little less himself. And that's where I think like there's this. And so the, the thing with the, the future article was talking about how hip hop culture, you got you got gang culture, drug culture, street culture, and like all of it kind of has been incorporated into hip hop culture and we just now say the culture but then people will tell, talk about the culture and be referring to all these different cultures that really don't have anything to do with the culture is hip hop hip hop those of you who, but just because we yeah. rap about it don't make it a part of hip hop like you can rap about if you rap about the streets does it make street the street shit hip hop you see what i'm saying yeah. and so it's like so when for, for me, and this is what I'm looking at with the whole culture thing with Drake is we feel like like people have a problem with him in the culture. So it's like, so you got this culture that's all of this stuff that Drake isn't necessarily, he ain't part of gang culture, street culture, all this stuff. He just raps. And it's like, that ain't enough for the culture. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, now it's this love-hate thing because the thing that makes him not a part of the culture is what makes him them skews stand. And so it's like love-hate relationship. So it's like you love him when he gives you a hit, when it crosses over, when he introduces you, when he does all of the things and gives the Drake effect, the stimulus package. But then secretly also at the same time, hate him because he's not like us. Let me tell you something. I guess this is just me. Mm-hmm. And it, it might sound cliche. Y'all love all motherfuckers. I, uh, dead ass, yo. I love like dead ass, bro. Right. I like I like the I like I like the corny nigga that's his self yeah. just as much as I like the gangster that's his self. You know what I mean? What people don't understand is like Tupac. Right. Tupac wasn't no fucking gangster. Right. Like out of all, he was a fucking thespian <laughs> that went to art school. He was Drake. Just the re- the verse. He's reverse drink. <laughs> Tupac went to Tupac went to art school. Yes. Then once he got that money and yeah. got around them gangsters, mm-hmm. he died a gangster. Yeah. Tupac done shot the police. He done been shot and, and came out. Mm-hmm. He done been to jail. He done. And I hate it because he got what he asked for. Yeah. He wanted to be in that life, and that life got wound up in, in encompassing him, and, and he got in that life. You feel what I'm saying? But what you got to understand about a nigga like Drake? Yeah, he not tough. No. But Jay Prince is that nigga manager. No. Jay Prince tough. No. No matter how y'all niggas look at it, Jay Prince tough. Mm. Everybody know Jay Prince tough. No. Baby tough. That, that's a different boogie, man. Yeah, ba- baby, baby tough. <laughs> this is it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and Drake signed the baby, too. Yeah. Lucy and Grange is tough. Yes. He the toughest nigga I just named. He the toughest nigga I just named. Lucy and Grange yo, is fucking tough. Like the toughest don't have goons that have Now goons. let me break something down to you. <laughs> when I moved, when, probably about when I was about 19 years old, I was living in this boarding house. Oh. And we got evicted. Long story short, everybody in the house got evicted. I was the last person to get evicted. It was this chubby girl that lived across from us. She's a real good friend, but I wound up smashing so I could have somewhere to stay. Mm-hmm. So I'm still in there. Layla found out everybody got to go. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? We robbing the crib now. because we I'm homeless. I'm fucked up. I don't yeah. got nothing. We looking for I'm looking for clothes to go on interviews with. Mm-hmm. I'm looking. This nigga was a chiropractor and there was a table upstairs. He was like, that's worth $3,000. I go into the attic. It's two big boxes in the attic. Mm-hmm. Long story short, 63 pounds of weed. Mm. Yeah. Came the fuck up, nigga. <laughs> Came the fuck. 63 pounds of weed. But I was scared. Right. Who the fuck is this nigga? Yeah. 
Because he never met me. He lives in Cali. His, right. his, 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 his girlfriend interviewed me. His brother cut the lawn. Yeah. She only seen me once at the interview. The brother never seen me. Yeah. So I'm like, but I'm still scared. Yeah. Because I had to get this nigga my information to get into this yeah. crib. I just took 63 pounds of weed from this nigga. Mm. But at the time, I was kicking it with Big Cat Records mm -hmm. that found Gucci Man. Yeah. Them was my niggas. That's who like, I wrote with before Gucci even was around, when they was fucking with um, PB, PBT. Okay. Remember Pretty Boy Thug? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were around 17 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. You know who PBT yeah, yeah, yeah. is. Yeah. So they fucking with PBT. I called my niggas. Mm -hmm. I, gave, I split that shit equally mm -hmm. with my niggas, and they all threw me one back. Mm -hmm. So I had about 20, and each of them had like seven, eight of them shits. Why did I do that? Mm -hmm. Them niggas is killers. Mm -hmm. I need somebody to hold me down just in case this shit blow back on me. Mm -hmm. Yes. So just because I might not mess, I'm only 19. I was a little tougher than Drake was, don't get yeah. me wrong. But don't sleep on me because I just motherfucking hired some hitters with that motherfucking bags. Right. Drake just got a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Really, 860, but a billion. Right. 400 from Lucian, 460 from Nike. Mm -hmm. Lucian called Kendrick. Mm -hmm. Said, bro, you need to chill. You about to fuck up my bag. Mm -hmm. Kendrick talking, uh, I'm like, man, Kendrick better chill the fuck out before we want to fucking pick up the papers and Kendrick is somewhere slump. Mm -hmm. We talking about the Jewish mafia. Mm -hmm. This is a nigga got enough money where he could give a nigga $400 million. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? So just because Drake ain't tough don't mean Drake ain't tough. Right. This is straight up. And I know I'm trying to let niggas know once you get in a certain tax bracket and you yeah. making a certain amount of money, you tough. You tough. Because I can give a nigga $2,000. That's it. I can give a crackhead out there $500 or a bag of weed, and he going to knock your head the fuck off if I say so. Right. So a nigga that got a billion dollars, that's, you know, what Puffy said it himself. He's going to go to jail for this shit, too. Puffy's going to jail. Yeah. Why did he go to jail? Because Puffy said this shit out loud. You can pay a mercenary $100,000, and they make it look like nothing never happened. Mm. He's done it. Trust me. Mm -hmm. You know who else did that shit? Clive Davis mm -hmm. to Whitney Houston. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Believe that. And to her daughter. Mm. How you die the same exact way a year later? Mm. Now y'all stay. Where your stake on go? Mm. You left it to your daughter. Trust me. Niggas is out here getting knocked the fuck. Michael Jackson got knocked the fuck off. Mm. Why did Michael Jackson get knocked off? That nigga owned majority of Sony publishing. Mm. Sony want their shit back. <laughs> Bottom line. Yeah. These yeah. billionaires. And that, like, that's a, it go to an interesting conversation. Like, it's like you watch like a movie, and it's like the like or like when the, the truck turn over and all the money flying out and people out there running and grabbing it. <clears throat> like, you know, it's like, and this is like hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. So what you think is happening when you in the eight figure range? You playing with niggas. <laughs> you, this, is like, what, this is what niggas got to understand. Because people like to, people like to use this word conspiracy theorists mm. so much. Mm. But they don't really take the time to understand. Like, I can't think a billionaire put a conspiracy out to protect his money mm -mm. And, the, and, the, and to keep a certain motherfucker in a place to keep making him money. Mm -mm. But I could think that this 17-year-old kid stood on the corner and said, you're going to be the general, you're going to be the capo, you're going to be the da-da-da-da, and we're going to sell drugs and make an empire. Right. I'm going to give this 17-year-old a conspiracy charge. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to give it to the billionaire. Mm -hmm. That can actually just make a call and say, yo, I got 50 grand if you go bust a nigga head right now. Mm -hmm. The motherfuckers let this, you know why we think that way? Because we're programmed mm -hmm. by the same niggas that's doing this shit. Mm -hmm. The same niggas that's doing this shit on the media. So they're the motherfuckers that's telling you it's a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And we just run with it and believe it all. Oh, no, that's not real. That's a conspiracy. I, like, like, get off on a tangent. No. Fuck Bill Gates. Fuck Bill Gates. 
Bill Gates' mother was cool with the nigga from IBM. Mm-hmm. That's how Bill Gates got his money. IBM put the money behind Microsoft. The same motherfucker, his father, a nigga wrote a, won a pull of supplies for writing an article about how IBM funded the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. The Watson machine is what it's called. Mm-hmm. Thomas Watson is who founded IBM. Mm-hmm. The Watson machine cataloged the Jews as they were getting brought to the Holocaust sites. Yeah. Because it was a eugenics experiment. They were experimenting on their eyes, hair, health, all of that shit because they're trying to make the perfect human. Mm-hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Now, his father took over Planned Parenthood after Margaret Singer died. Mm-hmm. Planned Parenthood was originally called the Negro Project Mm -hmm. because she went to a bunch of pastors and convinced them to convince their churches, the the girls, to have abortions and to use birth control and shit like that to kill black babies. (laughs) We won't say that Bill Bill Gates... Speaking of Kanye... (laughs) We won't say that that Bill Gates is a conspiracy... a a, a genocide pusher and pushing eugenics. Even though the same nigga got on TED Talks and said, well, the way we're going to do, um, the, the, the way that we're going to help everybody is to save people is by population control. Mm-hmm. And he had his little spill on how population control and birth, you know, maybe the, the parents um, that losing their children to sicknesses, if you made it to where they got vaccines and won't get sick and they won't try to have so many kids because they think their kid going to die. And it all sounded good. Mm-hmm. But Bill Gates, you banned from India. Mm-hmm. You, you, now, yeah. Okay, so I, I will. But we won't it give him a good. conspiracy. Okay, it We won't good. give him a conspiracy, but we'll, we'll, but, but we'll put it on a 17-year-old kid for selling drugs. It, it, is it a conspiracy if he's on the news saying it, Ted Talk saying it? No, it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> but but, but, for, no, us no, but think, like, for us to think, think they're calling us conspiracy theorists. Okay, yeah, it. for us to think that, to, to be saying, say it out loud. So that's, like, that's interesting. So, but check this out. Hold no, on. No, okay. Your father dealt in eugenics. Mm-hmm. Your mother dealt in eugenics. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to give you something that you're going to have to research on your own. That's crazy as fuck. Mm-hmm. Thomas Watson's granddaughter married Margaret Singer's grandson. Mm-hmm. Eugenics. Mm-hmm. Keeping in the all fucking blue blood. Mm-hmm. Keeping in the family. Those are eugenics companies. Eugenics still exists. They're, it is taught. It used to be taught in schools in England until mm-hmm. the Holocaust when they stopped it because it went too far. Yeah. So they just changed the name of the schools, but they still teach that shit. Mm-hmm. Straight up. So that's all I wanted to say. Like, stop giving conspiracy to 17-year-old kids and thinking these multi-billionaires ain't on real conspiracies that they actually have powers to control. Like, come on, man. Why Why was Bill Gates let back in? Why was Bill, I mean, Jeffrey Epstein let back into Harvard knowing damn well this nigga has a pedophile charge on him? Mm-hmm. He did two years for this shit. Mm-hmm. They snuck him in Harvard. Then you find out that the, the fucking doctor from Harvard, John Lieber, I think his name was, mm-hmm. and two Chinese chicks were sneaking fucking the deadliest diseases in the world in their socks on planes to Wuhan. Mm-hmm. Go to the Department of Justice website. Nigga went to trial and all that for that shit. It's, this shit is happening, everybody. <laughs> like, dead ass. But Drake versus Kendrick. Drake versus Kendrick. That's the... That's what. That's where we start. Everything, but that's, everything's, but that's what's on the news. Like even CNN, like even oh man, they got everything. They ask, they ask everybody. They ask Obama. What is I've you never like? seen a lynching mm-hmm. like I seen with Drake. Mm-hmm. Like somebody that everybody loved. I'm talking about literally. I had a nigga tell me how much he hate Drake, and in the same breath say, I drove all the way to New Orleans to his concert two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Before the beef, right? You feel what I'm saying? Like, what, like we are bandwagon motherfuckers, and that shit is crazy. I never really was like gave up. I used to love Kendrick. I still love Kendrick, yeah. but I hated how everybody jumped on that bandwagon. I think it's the underdog thing. I think, and I could be wrong with this, but I feel like it's the same thing with uh, Hov and, and Nas, because Hov was the the clear favorite. Just if you looked at their career up until that mm-hmm. point. 
and it was like the underdog. Like we, but they didn't try it. to destroy. No, no, no. Oh. I ain't saying that. But it, it, they, everybody loves a good underdog mm-hmm. story. So you identify with the person. And you said Hove lost. And yeah. everybody said Hove lost. And well, we don't live in we don't we live in the internet age. Yeah, but they right. never they didn't try to destroy him. They, they, they didn't try listen, to destroy Jay Z, bro. If we had Twitter back then, you don't think they would have? What they doing to him now is crazy. Yeah, like, that shit that they be saying about Jay Z yeah. now. That shit actually make me sad because I know how much that man do. Right. Like, he do so much for so many people. Like, putting kids through college, angel funding black businesses. Like, he does a lot of shit. And motherfuckers, he the devil. He this, he that. He, 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 he. I never listened to Jay-Z. He was whack to me. Like, come yeah. on, nigga. Like, come on. You, your father probably birthed you to that nigga. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, come the fuck on, yo. Like, when I moved to Atlanta, all the niggas, it'd be older niggas saying that shit. When I moved to Atlanta, nigga, if Jay-Z came in the city, it was like Obama was here. Yeah, yeah. Like, so for niggas, like, well, yeah, I didn't fuck with Jay-Z back then. Like, come on, son. Yeah. Like, but, you know, we live in that era. We live in that era of bandwagon and just say anything to sound cool. Like, so, and that's like the, I guess, kind of my thing. Well, the, how the internet destroyed the world. Oh, yeah, it's fucked up. It's like... I never got in the car and said, just, throw that Kendrick on. No, no, this, <laughs> is, this is how the internet destroyed the world. Why does a 13-year-old have a brand? Or care about their brand? What, what's in alignment with their brand? It's like, and it's back to that DIY thing, like... We're conditioned like corp like it's a reason why like like uh, the shit with the finance reform and all that stuff because like where corporations shouldn't be treated as people because corporations don't have soul they don't have a conscience they don't that's why they'll sit up and let a million cars go out that may kill X amount of people mm-hmm. because balance sheets rather than really caring and so it's like in that is like people have become corporations. Mm-hmm. Like we don't we 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 lose. You don't that say what you name. mean no more. You try to say what you was yeah. yeah like I like that's why I told you when we first got here. I'm like nigga, I say what the fuck. My brand is to keep it a buck. Yeah. Like that's my brand. I don't sugarcoat shit because I know I live a certain way. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? It's like the fuck you going to say about me? I work hard. I put people on. I don't charge niggas to perform on my stages like that. Like so, when I get up, like when I got up a bishop, the yeah. first thing I said in that shit was, "How many people in here have been on my stage?" Mm-hmm. More than half the room raised their hand. I said, "How many people I charge to get on my stage?" They put their hands down. I said, "Now let's go." Now I validated that what I'm about to say is real. You right. feel what I'm saying? Like. People too scared. I think, I, but I think that's, I think, I think that's even in entertainment. I think if a lot of niggas made statements right after they big debacles, yeah. they were like Chris Brown. Chris Brown would have said something after that Rihanna shit. We wouldn't have been on him so hard. He would at yeah. least said something. You know what I mean? I'm not saying it's cool to hit nobody, but we still don't know what the fuck happened. Yeah. If that nigga would have been like, yo, she threw my Lamborghini key out the motherfucking window. And I, I, I lost it all. She, she grabbed the wheel and turned the wheel and I almost crashed this $400,000 car and then we started fighting. Like, somebody would have understood. Yeah. There'd have been some niggas out there like, oh, I get it, nigga. She was wilding. Yeah. But your silence is an admission of guilt, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. No, like, and that, like, even going to, like, with that of being you. And I, and I it's like, because the world has changed. It's like, Real is fake and fake is real. Like, this shit upside down. It's like, I'm the same way. Like, what I say online, like, that's me. Like, people take pictures, you wanna see it? Like, brother, that's how I look. Whatever the fuck, <laughs> whatever the camera, the camera ain't about to lie, nigga. Like, <laughs> so it's just like that type of thing when I'm out and I'll go out of town, like, and I'm like, yo, you just like you are. I'm like, who else that would you be, expect? That should be weird to me, man. I, that, it's like, everybody's so fake. Because they're pretending, they expect that you're pretending. Mm-hmm. And like, that's the, the thing. Like, that's why I like, it ain't a lot of places that I go in the city. Like, I like, that's why I come out to Vine Fire. It's like, yo, I like the vibe. Like, it's just like, 
certain places is like, yo. All that I fake Hollywood shit. Bruh. And that's why we don't do that. Ain't no, ain't no standing on couches, popping bottles, VIP say, none of that, nigga. I don't give a fuck. Summer Walker come in there and sit ass right in the corner, right next to a nigga that's like, oh shit, that's Summer Walker. Yeah. Straight up. It ain't no extra special treatment, ain't nothing. The most I do is, oh, you good, you want something to eat, just to respect who she is. But, yeah, yeah you get in, you're going to walk around, there ain't going to be no extra security around you. You're going to motherfucking go in the middle and dance like everybody else. Yeah. Like, because you ain't better than nobody when you in this room. When you in Bonfire, I ain't better than nobody. I try to... I got a little temper sometimes. I'm not even going to lie, just from being old and going through so much shit. So a lot of times I stay in my office if it get overwhelming. Right. Hey, what up? You know, y'all want to rap? I want to yeah. vent. I want to. So I go in my office until about two o'clock. But I make sure I come downstairs and I'm shaking hands and kissing babies. Right. I'm motherfucking talking to people. People are like, damn, I ain't think you was gonna be so cool. Like, how else the fuck I'm gonna be? Yeah. I ain't nobody special, my nigga. You can hit the lotto and, and, and trump my ass tomorrow. Yeah. Like straight up. So I don't understand niggas that fake. And I don't understand niggas that that get uncomfortable around the real. Yeah. Is it, 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 the interesting thing that I've seen is it's the fake shit is more productive. Like, cause that, like, but it's more it's fake because it's more fake people. Yeah. And so it's like so the fake people, I, it's like the fake like so we having this conversation. It's like, you know, when you have when you connect with another real motherfucker, it be like, yo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, like the same people get that same shit. You can feel that shit immediately. <laughs> like, that shit crazy. If I'm, in a, if I'm around somebody, like my, my DJ, Instrumentals, that DJ yeah. Bonfire, me and that nigga like this because he's, he's me. Yeah. He a, he an angry old man. That nigga, he gonna, <laughs> he gonna tell the truth 100% of the time. That nigga's no, gonna I say mean, what the hey, fuck he feel. It's like, cause, and it's like, for me, is like like I like it took me forever to start doing the music reviews and start doing the music reviews and shit. But it's like I'm not about to pat you on your head and tell you your shit though. Like if I like it, oh, like that's I, him. He, he <laughs> that nigga. When we have those discussions about niggas' music after they get off stage, oh my god, I'd be like, give me the mic, man, yo. <laughs> yo, like, and that's and that's for me. It's just like, bro, like, but it's like. They grew up in a world like we we've 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 child proofed the world. Ain't no ain't no sharp edges. Everything soft. Everything's and it's like and it's like like it's really scary. Like and I be like yeah, I be it's scary my, as hell. I yeah. be talking to my son. My son's seventeen. Now, like and it's like and I be I be tough on him. Like when I talk to him, I talk to him very coarsely. Like, with, but always with love and I always, I, anything I tell I'm going to explain why. But it's like, and I had to like, because I'm like, bro, like, I, I, I wrestled with this when he was like five, six. It was like, I think it may have been when the Trayvon Martin shit happened. And it was like, and I'm wrestling like with trying to figure out like. How to add a talk? Yeah, it's like, do I, like. Put the I, fear in him and have him running around. Yeah. Do I raise him? Like you want be the change you want to see in the world. So do I raise him to be the change I want to see in the world, or prepare him for the world that he's gonna walk into? I prepare my daughter for that world. Yeah. Like straight up. To, but but you have to back back every once in a while and still push the 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 the, the, the it's, issue shit ooh, you it's just a, it's, it's a hard because balance. I tell you why. Mm -hmm. Especially having a girl, you know, yeah. you got rape and molestation yeah. and blah 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 blah. And you scared as a parent, you know yeah. what I mean? I'm like, damn, I don't want my daughter, because every woman I know, or every woman I've come in contact with outside of my family members, and even a couple of my family members have been raped. Yeah. Like, you sit down with them and you have these stories, and I'm like, damn, yo, like, I kill shit. Yeah. Point blank, period. Like, I'm trying to save myself. Yeah. Because my daughter come home and tell me anything I'm going to keep it a buck. Everyone must go sell. Yeah. <laughs> like, everyone yeah. must go. So, but, so that makes me tough on her, you know, to the point where I used to be like, suck it up. Suck it up. Da -da 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 -da. And one day we at this festival and she hits her head, I guess, because she came back looking dizzy 
and she, she hit her head. She like, I hit my head. I guess she, she either fell out the shit or the basketball hit her too hard. But it was her, like, you could tell she hit her head hard. Right. And she wouldn't cry. She was like, I'm sucking it up, Dad. I'm sucking it up. Mm. And I felt bad as shit. And yeah. I'm like, yo, if you really hurt, you can cry. Yeah. And she just let it go. And that day I realized, yo, you too tough. Yeah. Like, you got to let her still be girly. Or even human. Even human, and but still prepare her for yeah. the real world. You feel what I'm saying? So now I'm a little less like that, yeah. but I still let her know, like, yeah, this world ain't going to fucking be your friend. Yeah. Like, straight up. Like, you're going to have friends, but even them you got to pay attention to. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Luckily, she don't like going outside. She in that era. She on the computer all the time. And <laughs> Roblox she, and shit. Yeah, Roblox. <laughs> and, she know what I mean? She don't run the world. And I think that shit is going to transition into her adulthood to where mm -hmm. she do, does what she has to do outside. But she's going to be a homebody. But it's just as a father of a girl, and my daughter pretty, like mm -hmm. to, to the standards of society pretty. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Like, so, yeah. And, and she, she's 11 shaped like she's 22. My daughter's 12. Yeah, she Same shaped, situation. Yeah, shaped like she's 22. Like, no stomach, titties, ass, all that shit. And it's scary. Yeah. It's scary because when I said I, I got a song, I had a song that I wrote called Hate. And I said, I hate my I hate my daughter cause she growing. I hate her titties cause they showing. I hate that grown niggas looking cause I'm already knowing. I I, I hate that one day she gonna leave me. Uh, I, uh, and if a nigga do a, uh, I, I said, I hate that one day she going to leave me. And if a nigga do a greasy, he going gonna, to he, he gonna, he gonna hate it when he see me or some shit like that. Mm -hmm. But like, yeah, fucking, I'm watching her body perforate, her hair get longer, her face clear now. And I'm like, why she, I told my boy, I was like, yo, you won't even recognize. I said, I promise you, if my daughter walked past you, Mm -hmm. When she get past, if she you don't see her from the front, and she walk past, you gonna say yo shorty, and when she turn around, you are gonna be like oh my god, mm. <laughs> straight up and down. So that shit is that's some scary shit yeah. as a as a parent because yeah. niggas got no chill. Yeah, niggas got no chill. Increasingly, yeah, and Increasingly. and I'm not the toughest nigga in the world. I'm gonna run into a little gangster little nigga mm -hmm. that I'm gonna fuck around and have to knock the fuck off. Yeah, because he ain't gonna stop. Bro, like, so that's like, bro, I ain't been in, like, and that's one of the, the kind of things, like, with age, like, I I don't put myself in a lot of situations. I try to chill, and I, like, turn the other cheek, like, because it's like, because the age, and bro, I'm not about to tussle with you. Like, I don't know, I don't know if you can take an L. I don't know if I can take an L. I probably can't. <laughs> like, so it's going to go where it's going to go. Like, and if we ain't, if it ain't something worth going all the way there for then it's like, what we gonna do? I said, I said, I, said, I keep a 40. I ain't finna play. Mm -hmm. Nigga, I'm 40. We ain't finna fade. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> like, straight up and down. Like, the fuck you mean? Like, so, I say this much, man. I try to lead with love. Yeah. I'm not, I'm human. I make mistakes like everybody yeah. else. But I try to, especially if I take interest in people, you know what I mean? Like, I want to see them do well. Yeah. So I put a lot of motherfuckers on to shit. And a lot of them been ungrateful. I got a situation right now with somebody that hate me that I took from making nothing, literally, to 60 grand a year, car, management position. And this motherfucker right now will tell you I'm the devil. Yeah. And this shit crazy. Like, but it is what it is, you know what I mean? I'm never going to stop doing right. for folk, you know, because I, I get pride in that, especially, like, right now, I'm the man of my family. Mm -hmm. I'm the oldest man in my family besides my cousin who don't never come around. So I'm the oldest man around that's in my family. And I, I, I help my moms out. I help my aunt out. I help my little cousins out. I, did, I, I might call, my, I might put in a group text one, like, yo, we all going out today. Right. I'm paying for it. Balloon museum, bouncy house, the whole family type shit. Yeah. But I, I love that being able to do that kind of shit. Because that's who my grandfather was. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? And I ain't have shit. So to be in a position now where I can... When I was 
Bro, you just gave me like, there's no patriarch in hip hop. Mm -mm. Ain't no, no but no. they don't know, no, no. It's there. The, the, the young motherfuckers don't want it. Mm. The young, the, it's there. You know, you got, you got Jay-Z. You got Jay-Z helping everybody. You got Nas talking to these kids. You got all of these artists, but they don't. Well, you know what? See, I'll speak to, I feel like Busta in recent years has really made a very public effort to bridge the gap. Oh, yeah. Busta fuck with everybody. Yeah. He done got on songs with him. Yeah, he done did everything. Yeah, yeah. But they don't, you got to understand, it's cool to shit on history yeah. now. It is very cool. It's cool to say, yo, that motherfucker's old and that music. I never liked that music. It was trash. And yeah. they get so 128 million records. Yeah. You gonna sit there and tell me that you never like, come on, bro. But and sampling the shit. Interpolating shit. And like referencing shit at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I I say this much. I was having this discussion um with DJ Peanut. Mm -hmm. V103 put up a post and he was like, if you over 40, your opinion doesn't count because you don't push the needle. And I'm like, that's some bullshit because I push the needle. I motherfucking have niggas on my stage. Nigga, we paid the light bill to got the motherfucking turntable spinning. <laughs> like, at the end of the day. Yeah, <laughs> I push the needle because if you look at my platform, we have those young kids on our platform. On my, you too. Yeah. You, you push the needle. Yeah. You have these motherfuckers on your platform, in your magazines. You, I, I hang out with these niggas and find out what's up. They're like, damn, OG, you cool as hell and shit like that. I, and they, they will talk to me about their shit. And I give them real advice like we talking about right now. Yeah. They take it from me because I don't disregard their relevance. That's it. And that's what a lot of us old niggas do that turn these young niggas off. Yeah. You know, we try to, I tell niggas, I be like, bro, just because you 40 don't mean that 23-year-old not a grown-ass man. Yeah. That 23-year-old could have graduated from college, have children, have all of that shit. And you, because you old as fuck, you want to talk to this nigga like he a 10-year-old. Yeah. Hell yeah, that's not that. Talk to a man like a man. Treat a man like a man. And guess what you get from that man? Respect. Mm. Bottom line. But if your whole position is hating the, all the niggas in my era, yeah. in my era, like at the end of the day, even their music, even if I don't fuck with it, I try. Yeah. I listen to it. You know what I mean? I book niggas that I know the crowd gonna fuck with, even I, if I don't fuck I with it. I would say I slid into that old man shit for a, a little bit. Like, like. Because you get angry, because it's not yeah, like it, what you it, remember. It, and I've been there. Here's the thing I say, I fuck with people who are angry, because I know you care. Mm -hmm. Like it's too many people on the music side, like on this on the music industry business side. They all da 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 da. I was like, oh, I know you don't care because this would frustrate you if you deal with artists on a regular basis. You'd be pissed. You'd be pissed off. You'd like you won't be. It's like it's it's the fact that I have four kids that makes me like that gives me the temperament to work with artists the way I do. <laughs> I had a I had an artist. Um, her name is Blake. Blake the plug. Okay. Blake the Plug, um, I'm really, really a fan of this girl. Mm -hmm. I like because I watched her during COVID. She was on um, Country Wayne TV show. Okay. For the for the whole COVID, she was they had that TV show with her and Rhonda. I think mm -hmm. the name is. She was Rhonda's daughter or whatever. And um, or it might have been Rhonda. I forgot what her name is. But I watched like. Every episode, I watched this girl basically grow up. She was a little skinny high school girl. Now she's this thick rapper. And I wanted to support because I loved her personality on that show. Mm -hmm. And she has the same personality when it comes to her music. Right. Um, and so I, so I reached out to her, told her how dope she was. And she was supposed to do Bonfire. And something happened where she couldn't make it. So I was like, I'm gonna I'm I'm spin the block with you again. And I tried to get her to do this roller skating shit. Cause I'm like, look, I'm doing this roller skating shit and you'll be able to do, be intimate with your fans. It's something that you can actually come and like, be intimate with your fans. And she stopped responding for that. But when I started talking about bonfire again, she got a little energetic. Mm -hmm. And she was like, word, so she's supposed to do last weekend. Mm -hmm. She's supposed to do bonfire. And I was so hyped and Last minute, right before the shit, 
somebody called me. I don't know who this old nigga was, but he was like, her label didn't approve it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, we the number one weekly event in the country. Like, straight up and down. And I just didn't understand it, bro. And I never got a call. It wasn't no my bad or nothing. Yeah. It was just like, I'm just not coming. After yeah. I done wasted all this time getting you flyers and booking you and doing all this shit. And it ain't no hard feelings. I still support her as it's an a, artist. It's a disappointment, though. Yeah, like, really, it's really. Like, it really hurt my feelings, bro, because bro, I, I was really trying to support. Like, and I really, I fuck with her music because it, it, it's nostalgic. She got a lot of classic sounding music. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm like, yo, she gonna go because she Man. got this energy, this personality. She cute. She got a nice shape and all. I was like, she about to go. And that shit just, you know what I mean? And it's like, like that's the, for me, like that was the whole thing where the membership came from. It's like, um, when I first started the magazine, like I had, you know, I, I was doing music first and I made money doing music and I just came down here and I was kind of just kind of living off the money that I put to the side. And I was like, so when I started doing the magazine, it was just like a little passion project mm -hmm. just because I got tired of like on the consultant stuff, like answering the same question a million different times. So I said, I'm going to put it in a magazine, answer it once to a million different people. Mm -hmm. And so then it was like, I, I didn't want to put no artists in the magazine. Like the first few issues, it was no artists. It was all just, I wanted in my head, it was like Entrepreneur Magazine. So I just wanted to talk about the business. This is how you market on MySpace. Here are the events that's going on. This is where you get to just see me do back, it. Boy. That's it. But it was like, damn, the only people who want to spend money advertising is artists. artists. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gotta fuck with them. That's so I was like, all right, it's up. <laughs> so, but then in doing that, it was like, once, once it's available, then it's like, people don't want like, to spend no money. Like at the same time, I want to be in the magazine because I see you got people in the magazine, but I also, I'm dope, so you should do it for free. And it's like, and it's like, my wife would tell you like every other month, I was like, man, fuck that magazine. Like, like and, and to the point where um, like, for me, the, the reason like I love this and I love the culture and I love the artists and I know and I'm I'm like I talk tough to artists like like and I I be having to pull myself back because I talk to them like they my kids sometimes not because they're young but because I love them. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah yeah yeah. I, do I, and I know you, when you see your like when you see potential with a motherfucker when you see and they not living up their own shit. And you yeah. know like you know what it can do for them and it's like and it'll be frustrating. So it's like, but that was the whole thing for me with doing the membership was like, cause I was on some real, like when I got down here, everything was real clickish. And I just wanted to be like, yo, be able to help whoever. Like it, ain't, it don't matter. And then the guy saying like, yo, you can't just do that. Cause like these motherfuckers will drain you. So. Dang, these artists, man, artists will shoot themselves in the fucking foot. Like yeah. assuming they bigger than they are. Mm -hmm. Um. I'll give you a prime example, and we, we good now because we finally got the shit done, but Asian A mm. was hard for me to work with at one time because, you know, the first night she was supposed to do Bonfire, you know, we got a strict policy on guests, mm. you know what I mean? We let every artist have three free guests, and then the rest of your guests play friends and family, which is half price, mm -hmm. you feel what I'm saying? And um. She left because I couldn't, we wouldn't let her bring 10 motherfuckers in. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? And that, that rubbed me the wrong way. But Shorty from Cream Magazine is like her person. Mm -hmm. And I'm cool with Chantel, really cool with Chantel. She's, she, she always been good to me. She got a couple issues with other people, but she ain't never did nothing wrong to me. So I fuck with her. Right. So I, every time I booked A's and A, it was because of Chantel. I was trying to do her a favor. So I had an event that was a, it was around A3C weekend, but it wasn't an A3C event mm -hmm. that I did. I had um, Derez, Deshaun, and T-Rail and motherfuckers like that. And of course, the artists, Derez, Deshaun, T-Rail, and them, they got the set. Mm -hmm. And then the artists, some artists open for them, some artists supposed to go after them. Asian A was one of the artists supposed to go after. It was her, Detroit, Barbie, a mm -hmm. couple of other people. You know what I mean? That's my motherfucking guy. She's the professional heartfelt motherfucker, mm. Detroit Barbie. And when it came time to get to 
the section where the other artist is supposed to go, Asian Age Detroit Barbie, Asian Age was supposed to go after Detroit Barbie because that was the lineup the whole time. Mm -hmm. She done gave her music to Derez Deshaun and T-Rell and DJ, and they about to spin her shit right now. Right. But it's about to fuck up the rotation, and then when we like stopped it, she left. Right. And luckily, she was able to come. I think she came maybe three weeks ago, maybe three weeks or a month ago. It finally performed. Mm -hmm. Hugged me, gave me a kiss on the cheek, and we, you know what I mean? It was just love. Yeah. And from now on, it's like, it's love. And it's been love, but I had that shit in my heart. Yeah. Because I'm like, damn, you keep playing with me. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? I'm like, yo, this ain't all like, you know what I mean? Artists begging to get on this stage, and I'm trying my best to get you on it. I know you getting big, and your shit's starting to, you know, take off. Yeah. But it's like, so was Little Donald when I had that problem out of him. Yeah. Kiki Palmer was already Kiki Palmer. Yeah. I ain't had that problem out of her. Like, artists got to start realizing, bro, it ain't for me. Yeah. You got a whole bunch of fans out there that seeing your flyer, that's expecting you to perform, you just disappointed them. Yeah. And I, I think that's, a, that's a, a point of maturity. And, like, getting to, like, and, and that also character. Like, it's like, it's been times, bro, you know, doing these events with independent artists and doing stuff like took L's to make sure that everybody was good. What they was promised and mm -hmm. everything happened the way it was supposed to happen. And it's like, don't nobody care. Don't it's nobody like, give a fuck, don't bro. Don't nobody give a fuck. Bonfire ain't, in the wintertime, we slow down dramatically. Obviously, yeah. people come to Bonfire, even people who know we got it inside for some reason and they funky ass head associate bonfire with just outside. Yeah. So when the wintertime come, we slow down. You feel right. what I'm saying? So what they don't get is all winter. We talking about all winter. Some some of them days, we put we coming out of our pocket with $2,000 plus from the bank. Mm -hmm. We ain't make a dime to pay y'all niggas. Or we made enough to pay enough niggas, but we still, I, I, I will, I will, our bill every Sunday is between seven and $9,000. Mm -hmm. That is how much it costs to throw bonfire. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Bro, I was listening. I was in there. I was looking. I was looking at these trucks and these lights and this. Stuff. Like, I was like, this is a goddamn production. Like, do every they leave Sunday. this shit here? Do they set this shit up every time? Like, that's what I'm looking at. Like, when we when we got a space like we yeah. had on Bankhead, yeah, yeah, we leave it there. And I was yeah. a blessing for two and a half years. Yeah. When we like we is now, when we go back on the move, yeah, yeah that shit gets set up. At 8 o'clock. Yeah. At 8 o'clock, they start. In two hours, that shit is bonfire. Yeah. And it's been like that. So, you know, but but then I'll have arguments with, like, staff and shit like that when, like, um, yo, y'all made it big tonight. Why we don't get no bonus? Niggas, because y'all niggas got paid all winter and yeah. I didn't. Yeah. Like, I ain't make a dime and I spent money. Like, we watching the bank account dwindle, bro. Yeah. 2000 a week. Just yeah. to make sure these niggas get paid. And, and, and that goes, so, and this is the part of the entrepreneurship shit, and I think the boss shit, like, that I don't think gets talked about. But like Ho said, everybody's bosses till it's time to pay for the offices. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, and there's that, there's that, for me, I remember my first business that I had, like, um, well, I ain't gonna say my first business, but my first magazine um, was in, um, in Indiana, actually. I used it to promote my music. And I remember my first employee that I brought on um, to do ad sales. And I'm like, this nigga's like 40. And I am like 22 years old. And he got a daughter about to go to college. And it's just like, I got to make sure this nigga can get money. <laughs> Straight up, you got to make sure you can't waste niggas' time. And it's like that type of shit. Like, like I like, and it's just like, the when you when you when you're in these positions like when you a solid individual you think like that but it's just like so oh man I done had so many niggas throw events and then at the end of the event try to run off like fuck the staff we yeah. ain't make no money and I'm like nigga what like you bugging these niggas getting paid we go yeah. home broke nigga yeah but I, and I think <coughs> that's the that that's my thing is like people like that think like us. Are in the like the minority? 
the vast majority of people will run off. You know where I get my shit from? I get my shit from rich dad, poor dad. Ready to. Find professionals, pay them what they deserve, sit back and get rich. Mm. Bottom line. Yeah. Like, you got motherfuckers there. My people that have been working at Bonfire, a lot, some of them niggas been working there 11 years. Mm-hmm. Some of them motherfuckers been working there two, three months. But at the end of the day, everybody deserves to get paid what they work for. Mm-hmm. If you sat there and stood your ass up for fucking six hours on your feet to do security at the end of the night or the next day when the money settled, you're going to get paid. Mm-hmm. Even if I can't afford to pay you. Mm-hmm. But, 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 you know, it's a, it's a real thing to step out on faith. Yeah. You know, when you feel like something is for you. Yeah. People post a lot of co- uh, quotes that they don't live by. Yeah, it's a real thing. I, I just got a building, 9,000 square feet, mm-hmm. on, on Whitehall Street next to Blue Ivy. Okay. And it need a lot of renovation. I probably got to put like a quarter million into it. I ain't got that shit, bro. Yeah. I got 10 months of free rent, and I'm going to figure that motherfucker out, though. Because, you know what I mean? I want to make sure that my company's straight. I want to make sure we got our own shit. We ain't got to keep moving. We ain't got to yeah. keep... And I'm stepping out on faith, and I'm going to make it shake. If not, I lost 40 grand. Yeah. But fuck it. And, and it's like, so, and this is, like, going to, like, that. It's like, with the community and the people that Bonfire has and the people who've come out to Bonfire and the big names that have come out to Bonfire. And it's like, you would think... Oh, that we be straight? No, it would just no, because I I'm on this I I get it. Like, yeah, people I, don't I know it. intimately like that. The support is so to a certain degree surface level. Yeah, surface level. It's if like, niggas jumping on something that's popping. You know what? Niggas don't support. Niggas patronize. Yes. Like like you coming out to bonfire ain't supporting it. It's patronizing because you came out for now. Now how? Wait wait wait. Because you came out for a yeah. good time. Now, reposting the flyer, that's something you didn't have to do and gives benefit that that's you don't support. get nothing out of. And so, like, that's what, so so when it's like, I don't support Walmart. Let's shop there. Patron. <laughs> yeah. You feel me? So I was like, so that's, and so that's like having to make that distinction because it'd be like when it's us and in the culture, we tend to think that patronizing is support. And, and it's like, and, and it does help keep the lights on. If we don't get that patronage, like, we will be out of business. The, the people who support us, I ain't even gonna lie, Zone 1 Police Department, mm-hmm. them, them niggas fuck with us for real. Fire The fire chiefs, them niggas fuck with us real heavy. Um, but the city, the city wants to use us, but doesn't want to take care of us. Mm-hmm. You know, when it's come time for an election, you're going to get Kwanzaa Hall and Vincent Ford, and even Stacey Abrams, mm-hmm. putting campaign tables because they know that we got a crowd. Like That's what be letting me know they know we exist yeah. when them niggas pop up. But knowing how much of the culture we encompass, knowing that we not only support the creators, if you go to um, the other location over um, Donnelly Hollowell, we talking about 20 acres, we talking about 200,000 square foot buildings, full of art mm-hmm. from local artists. The whole, every wall has a mirror on it. Every single wall, five buildings, 20 acres. You feel what I'm saying? When you start talking about the staff, we have 30 staff members. When you start talking about the events that we throw, we gave opportunities to people that nobody would give opportunities to to throw their events. Talking about 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 people events. You feel what I'm saying? And we logistically supported them. Not just give you a space. We sit down and have logistics meetings and we add what you need. You need stat, you need security, got you. You need fucking sound, got you. You need motherfucking um transportation from this lot to that lot. Everything we could do to help them. We did over the last three years. We did park a lot concert. We did fucking pink flamingo events. We did Playboy Cardi birthday party. We did all of these shits on um, um, fucking um, Little Nas X party, mm-hmm. birthday 
video party. We do everything for niggas to make sure that niggas can get their shit off. Don't nobody be giving a fuck about making sure we straight. Yeah. Like, straight up, when Crunch Town come in this million dollar business that supports families, not only from us, from employees, from managers, from all these people, don't nobody give a fuck. Yeah. It's always the city coming around talking about these permits that they issue out like motherfucking prizes. They don't get these permits out just off based off of what you done, the paperwork and shit like that. That shit be they know who you are, they fuck with you, they you know what I mean? This shit just weird. You got this mayor and and that's supposed to be this mayor to everybody. This nigga knows me from the club. Mm -hmm. This mayor used to be outside. He yeah. seen me in City Hall and was like, oh, what yeah. up? Yeah, Dre. <laughs> Dre. Dre, yeah. no niggas. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? But he ain't doing shit for niggas. Mm. At all. Name me something that this nigga did besides shut down niggas' businesses. Mm. That's it. Oh, they had a shooting that they fought? Shut down. Like, nigga, I can't control all the time a nigga shooting. I don't know. Like, I, I did all I could. Do. So I had a party the other day. I, we searched everybody. Did. Nigga slid a gun under the gate. Mm. The best I could do is get on stage. Like, nigga, the camera saw you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Nothing happened. But you, like, no matter how much security, how much you do, you don't know what the fuck a nigga going to do. Mm. You don't know. A nigga can have a fucking blade in his mouth. Mm -hmm. Like, get in there and talk buck 50 in there. You don't know. Yeah. So to sit there and... Oh, if, he, if they have an incident, we're going to shut their bit. Like, nigga, 50 people work at this business. Yeah. You about to make 50 people unemployed because of a, an incident that was out of the control of motherfuckers in a place that got a track record where they don't have no incidents? Nigga, we open 11 years, only had three incidents. That is great. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, bro. Start taking the time to sit down with these people and figuring out who they are. Start figuring out what they into, shit like that. And then you start making your decisions. Don't just blanket a decision based off of, well, we said we were going to shut down a business that had an incident. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, but they don't get it, though. Like, suppose somebody shut down your shit because of the fucking incident you had. Yeah. You just had the water pipe bust in the whole city. Suppose a nigga be like, yo, you ain't the man no more because you had an incident. Yeah. Facts. Like, the shit just be crazy, bro. That's why I, I don't know, man. I just, I'm going I'm to kick some real shit. I don't give a fuck how much flack it get. But I don't give a fuck. Atlanta has a mafia. A black mafia. Mm-hmm. That controls shit. Straight up. Like, fuck the white people and the permits and the MPUs. We talking about the niggas that sit in the government offices that hand out the, that actually hand out the permits to actually help make sure that your business gets a liquor license. Like, yeah, the, the MPU could vote on it, but they still got to get approved by the fire department, still got to get approved by the police department, still got to get approved by all of these shits. And there is a mafia in place. No matter what niggas say, I'll give you prime example. We had a fucking Super Bowl party. Uh, Mike Mars, he want to go out tonight. You got to wait, nigga. Yeah. We had a Super Bowl. I don't, I don't, I don't want the edit to miss it. Okay. We had a Super Bowl party right across the street from the Super Bowl, like directly across the street. Now, who owns the property? The church that got bought out to put the stadium uh -huh. there. Yeah, I mean, that's what Ludacris' mom does on Luda Day or whatever yeah. the fuck. So the church is the ones who approached us. They wanted us to do bonfire across the street from the Super Bowl from 11 o'clock till 3 in the morning. They had an installation before the Super Bowl, you know what I mean, at that same time, like at the same time frame. And um, so now 11 o'clock comes. We done spent the grip of money. We got 50000 in pre-sales. And... The cops start trying to shut down the park. So we like, what you doing? They're like, well, this permit only goes to 11. An oversight from the church. Mm -hmm. So they was like, we are call the permit holder. And if she say that you can move forward, then we cool with it. You know what I mean? We here anyway. It's the Super Bowl. The permit holder was Ludacris's mother. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Now, she got a relationship with the same church. They call her. She's at the Super Bowl. She said, cut it. Mm. 
without a discussion, without anything. It was just so easy for her to say, cut it. And I was just like, damn, lady, you just cost me a quarter million dollars. Like, and you ain't even give a fuck. Mm-hmm. Like, straight up. And, and, and yeah, it, it is motherfucking um, gatekeepers in Atlanta. And yeah, some of your biggest celebrities and they mothers and their foundations are that. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I mean, I was just one example, but there's a lot of them. You know, you got, don't put it past the killer mics, the TIs. Don't put it past none of them. Like, there's some gatekeepers in this city that make sure that, you know, other motherfuckers in the city ain't getting it like they getting it. Mm-hmm. Nah, when I first came down, and that's one of the things I noticed, like, uh, it, it, the not being from Atlanta. Like, hilarious story. We do the kickback on Monday. Mm-hmm. So artist down here. And um, I asked where he's from. And he's like, um, uh, originally from Cali, but I, I moved down here. I've been down here since I was three. And we be, nigga, you, you from, from Atlanta. Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the gatekeeping in Atlanta to say that like if someone was born in Grady or someone from Atlanta, it's like it's it's gatekeeping to even saying that to where like nigga you don't have a memory anywhere. I was <laughs> like you know I don't remember nothing from when you know I was what three. I tell these little <laughs> niggas when they try to when they be like you don't know um, you ain't even from here. <laughs> nigga I've been in this motherfucker for twenty six years. Mm-hmm. When you I moved here when you was in diapers, nigga. Mm-hmm. I put work in and all the projects that you scared to go in, nigga, mm-hmm. from motherfucking. Um, Herning Homes to University Homes, Rest in Peace University Homes and Herning Homes, from motherfucking um, Four Seasons Mm -hmm. to even the Hoods in Thomasville and all. I was on all them shits, moving and putting in work when I first moved out here. And they got, yeah, I'm not born and raised in Atlanta, but I'm enough Atlanta. Right. Yeah, you can't sit there and talk. But I ain't really never really had that problem when it came to niggas because. I, I immediately was in, like, the worst hoods. I was on the run. I ain't had yeah. nowhere else to go. The hood accepts you. Yeah. But no matter what you got going on, the hood will accept you. So I was in the hood with the niggas that was the niggas. Yeah. You know what I mean? And fucking, I never had a nigga come to me. You ain't from here, so you know, because I never tried to act like I was better. And I never tried to overstep. Right. You feel what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to learn from y'all. I'm going to hustle with y'all. Shit like that. I ain't coming trying to take over a nigga block and yeah. shit like that. Like, so I ain't never really had that problem with a nigga be like, oh, you ain't from Atlanta. Like, nigga, I moved to Atlanta in 1998. Mm. Like, straight up and down. You got me by seven years. That's what I'm saying. I was, I was 19 years old. Yeah. I've officially, I've been here way longer than I was in New York. Yeah. And that's just straight yeah, up. That's a conversation me and my wife had to have, like, Cause we met here, like she from Mississippi, I'm from Indiana, and it's like we've been together 19 years, married 17 years, and it's like we just having a conversation, like, like where are we gonna be buried at? Like, like this is where we from. Like all our kids are from here. And yeah, like, my daughter from Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and it's like, and we had to like just remember, like, oh, our kids are from here, like. It's like there's this whole life that we both have and memories and all this. They don't know nothing about Say that I had to, that shit fucked me up. Too. I said it thought. I was like, damn, my daughter is from Atlanta. Yeah. Because like, I'm talking about Brooklyn, but she fucking don't know shit about That's some Brooklyn. Shit on t- it's, a, it's a fictitious play. It's like, it's something. Yeah. It's an idea. She begging me to go there. I'm going to ride the train. She's like, no, you don't. No, the fuck you don't. Oh, shit. Nico Bonfire Security. What the fuck you want, Nico? Hold on, I gotta answer this. No, I can't. I'm on live. Let me tell him to text me. Please text me. Yeah. But yeah, fucking, um. But yeah, like I was saying, I. But Atlanta, Atlanta definitely saved my life. Mm-hmm. And that's why I defend Atlanta so much. Yeah. Um. Nigga. Hold on, let me answer this shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally live doing the interview, bro. Hello? 
This nigga ain't even calling me. He butt dialing me. <laughs> this shit crazy. Damn. Shit about to die anyway soon. Yeah, you still here? Good looking, y'all. Let me put this shit back up. I'm sorry. Nigga butt dialing me. Pause. Yeah. But, um... But yeah, I defend Atlanta, and that was the whole shit with Bishop. Mm. The whole shit with Bishop was the fact that, hold on, let me make sure this shit is, because I can't even see myself what it like it was. There we go. Yeah, the whole shit with Bishop, ATL Top 20 was, bro, I'm not from here, mm -hmm. but I've been here long enough. Bro, you not from here, and you just keep stirring up shit. And beefing with this nigga and that nigga, and every post you make is negative. And I'm like, you fucking the city up. Yeah, you know I mean, Atlanta ain't a city except for like Thug and, and what's the name of them and yeah. motherfucking on um, YF, 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 YF. But Gucci. that's it. Besides that, Atlanta a peaceful ass city. Mm -hmm. Like niggas, niggas who actually entertaining niggas ain't beefing with each other mm -hmm. like that. Like that's some New York shit. So why the fuck is everything is just fuck this DJ and fuck that person and fuck like come on bro you if you don't like somebody don't fuck with them mm. you got motion niggas gonna need your motion this is gonna keep going mm. I'm the master of not fucking with a nigga I will <laughs> nigga I will smile and but, shake your hand and do all of that shit but yeah I'm not fucking with you see that's me. I'm the opposite like my if I don't fuck with you, I don't fuck with you. Like, I can't even muster it up. How you doing? You live? <laughs> You're on the air. Are you, are you at the spot? I'm at Barcelona. Look at you. Always in the mix, bud. Uber, well, shit, I am... Are y'all done? Nah, we're almost done. I'll, I'll hit you soon as I'm finished. All right. My shit don't stop. Boy, that shit just go, go this, this, this is what it's like. We got to leave all this in just so people can see what, what it is to be... This shit crazy, boy. I'm going to just go off a lot. My shit about to die anyway. I'm about to turn this motherfucker off because it's about to die. Power off, yeah, power off. But yeah, um, like I was saying, man, I defend this city because I'm like, bro, never will you be on Bankhead at the bank and say, fuck little Bankhead, mm -hmm. and you from St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Like, that's crazy to me. And nobody here feels like they need to say anything like, that's crazy. All y'all niggas going to kiss this man's ass and get y'all shit on the radio. All y'all niggas have used this man to break your shit, to get your shit on the radio, all that. And you going to let this nigga, because at the moment he got a platform that is jumping, you going to let this nigga stand on big head at the bank in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia, and say, fuck Lil Bankhead as his opening statement to his show. See, I wasn't there. That was the opening statement? That's the first thing he said is, Lil Bankhead is a bitch. And nobody in the room felt anything about that shit. And this is supposed to be an empowerment mm -hmm. situation. It's DJs and artists. Mm -hmm. And that is how we start this shit. Right. And so, and that kind of go into two things, real quick. One, just the internet. Like, that's... That's the, the power of the internet. Like, because the algorithms lean toward the negative shit. Like, negative and negative gets more engagement, period. Just, it, it taps into the most basic urges in the human. Like, so it's like, it comes offline. Like, we, so it's like, like, life is becoming a reflection of what's online. Like, so, and then they go back to the fact that all them people that was at the bank, I know a lot of y'all fuck with Lil Banghead, and it's just the fact that, what I can't remember, uh, I think it was like Jay-Z talking about 
don't tell me like about what they said. Tell me why they were so comfortable to say it to you or say it around you. And it's just like if 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 you fuck with somebody, like and so like you just you cool with someone disrespecting someone that you fuck with. I got a whole song about that shit mm -hmm. called "Don't Tell Me What They Say About Me." Tell me that you told them you don't play about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't tell me what they say about me, nigga. Tell me what you did about it. Tell me what you did about it, nigga. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, what else I said? You don't got to like me. Got a daughter that love me. And mm -hmm. some niggas that kill for me. I dare you to touch me. Tell me how you fuck with me. Walk away and say, fuck me. Please don't tell me what he said. Tell me why he was comfy. Mm -hmm. Niggas that ride for me, he splitting his money. I see some niggas split from me and try to become me. Got no father figures, so it's hard to sum me. And a mama that need me, so you niggas is lucky. Six from the four, five, make you crap on yourself. Get exposed, your cold soul just happened to melt. I refuse to sit at home and feel sad for myself. I'm ten toes until my soul's as thin as my belt. <laughs> Are you finished with me? You just finish yourself. Well, let's take it to trial. You just finish yourself. Holding on to old shit could limit your health. I let go and let go with no menaces help. Nigga, don't tell me what they say about me. No, tell no. me that you told me don't play me about me. I want you to look in the camera and tell them why you ain't released this shit. Shit, it's, it's actually, believe it or not, it's coming. I, I'm actually starting a crew of mm. old niggas okay. called the Expendables. I fuck with that shit. I fuck with that shit. That, I fuck with that shit. Fuck called the Expendables, <laughs> and Yo. we about to get called in the duty. Yeah, we about to get called nah, in the duty. Dope. Yo, listen, hold on. We get, Yo, nah, that shit dope, bro. Listen to this verse, <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you this is why I'm releasing. This is the one verse that uh, made me say, "Yo, fuck that." This I'm shit, dropping. Got, these niggas need to get yes. this work, nigga. <laughs> Same song, second verse. I said, "If our team don't play together, can we really win?" If our kids don't play together, is we really friends? I ain't had 50 cent for rent, but I had many friends. Made a million, now I feel like 50 cent and many men. Hey, and this so feminine, two should be synonyms. I know you heard what Big said, it's all about the Benjamins. I ain't got a benefit to want to see my niggas win, but I ain't got a penny pinch. My pocket's thick as venison. My energy harmonious, so miss me with the dissonance. It's seven inch, you ignorant. So to avoid the incident, it's best I keep my distance. Cause my temper start to kicking in, niggas start to disappear. Family start to missing them. I'm living off experience, like style sheet kissing them. Me versus me, see, I don't need Swiss them. Situation win win on the pot. I'm pissing it. God like tendencies and nigga, this your christening. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, nigga, got to hear this. That's cool. Them first two bars, nigga. Like them first two bars. Yeah, nigga. If our it, kids don't nigga, play together, it's nigga really, really friends. friends, nigga. Like, like straight up. That, that's what like, and that's come this industry shit, and I'm it. Like I'm maybe on spectrum, like nigga, because I just don't gel with a lot of this shit, like. But it's like, I, I don't I don't tell you, like, when nigga asks, do I know somebody? Like, like I said, like, yo, I don't know you. I feel like I know you now. You feel me? Like, like we move around, talk, like, but that's surface level shit. Like, like, knowing, okay, you got kids, you got a wife, you got this, like, knowing your story, knowing, like, if a nigga told me you did something, I would be like, Really? Terry did that shit? Like, like where I feel like I know you to be able to predict the, but like if a nigga tell you this, like, oh shit, for real? Like, nigga, I don't know you. And so it's like, that's that, that's that, like that bar hit for me. Cause it's like, you know, this industry shit, niggas act like they know you. And it's like, man, niggas know. That'd be so funny to me because when niggas do see me get out of what they seem, they deem my character, mm -hmm. they be like, oh man, you wildin', son, that ain't you. I'm like, nigga, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea, bro. I can easily turn, like, my street name is Shice. Everybody mm -hmm. in this city knew me as Shice. Even when I was rapping, I was mm -hmm. Shice. You feel what I'm saying? Fucking, I tell niggas, that nigga, if you activate that nigga, ain't no going back. Because mm. that motherfucker don't got no chill. And when he come out, you know it. These eyebrows start clinching, and the nigga, nigga got that shit in his eyes. And yeah, but I try to, that's why you know yourself. Yeah. Especially at this age, it's not cool to become that way. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? So I, I stay away from a lot of shit. And, and a lot of shit I let go. I be like, yo, but if I say you got it, and you keep going, I punch you in your mouth. No questions asked, because I gave it to you. Like, you yeah. know what, bro? You right. 
And whatever, and when I say you're right, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish from whatever we going through, you're gonna get. Like, like, I owe you money. All right, nigga, here. Yeah. Once I give you that money, yeah, you better have gave me that, cause you know, give me my money back, nigga. Yeah. Straight up, no questions asked. And if you want to take it to other places, we can take it to other places. I'm a broad daylight nigga. Yeah. Like, but I got a daughter, got a wife, and that's why I just stay away from motherfuckers, man, because. I, I got I, I got PTSD yeah. from the hood. I literally clinically diagnosed PTSD from shootouts and all this crazy shit that niggas was in. But I also believe as black people, we got cultural PTSD. Yeah. That's why it's hard for us to accept accolades sometimes and shit like that because we just used to being told to be humble and shit like that. I'm just starting to step out my shell and take my accolades. Like, yeah, nigga, we throw this dope event. Yeah, I'm educated. I got a doctorate in international business, a master's degree in marketing. Yeah, I motherfucking own this business, that business, that business. I turned shit around. I took my barbershop from a nigga having to pay 200 a month because he ain't have enough barbers to we making $5,600 profit a month now. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? I only had that shit with him for a year. But I'm taking my accolades now because who the fuck else gonna give it to me if I'm not willing to give them to myself? Yeah. But but that's what as as we suffer from PTSD on many levels and we don't take the time to diagnose it and work on it. I suffer from PTSD and my temper would be bad and all of that kind of shit. The only time that I ain't really like I know I'm good is my daughter. Yeah. I say that shit in a lot of one of my brothers and my daughter say y'all niggas. Yeah. Like straight up and down. Like she saved a lot of niggas out here, man. She saved my life. That shit changed me. Like when she when my daughter was born, when she was like a year old, I was like, I took I looked at her mother, I was like, I wanna get married. And then I was like, yo, I gotta get my life right, like my credit and shit like that. And when yeah. I went and checked my credit, I had like 70 grand left over from student loans that I could go take. And that's why I put myself back in school for my doctorate. Because I'm sitting there like, fuck it, I got to have all this backup because I got a child. Yeah. Niggas don't give a fuck about their kids, bro. Niggas be having kids and still be outside doing dumb shit and still, still be... Nigga, I wake up every morning on the grind. Every single morning, nigga. Like, I, I take an edible, go to sleep. I wake up refreshed in the motherfucker, 9 o'clock in the morning. And motherfucker, it's time to, work. To, time to make it shake. Yeah. Some, you know, we got a plan because you write it down before the night. Yeah. Like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. But, like, for the most part, when it comes to, like, there be no plan. Yeah. You got to wake up and make it plan. Yeah. Like, make it, you got to, you know what I mean? Like, and niggas don't get that. Niggas don't get, you know, yeah, we Listen, got. This was supposed to start at 830. <laughs> like, it's like, it don't even, like, bro, like, and so here's the thing, because I'm like, but, you know, you would, hit, you would also text me back that you was going to pick up the keys at 7.30. Yeah. So in my head, it was like 7.30. Like, cause that was the last number I saw, even though I knew it was yeah. 8.30. So then I'm like, I'm moving around doing stuff. And, um, and it was like, it was like, ah, shit. All right, I'm about to be running behind. So I'm like, cause I'm doing that, like, let me get down. I was like, nah, I don't know why I'm rushing it. It's 8.30. So then it's like still, so I'm I'm taking a leisurely drive down here. And it was like, all right, I got time to set up and everything. Let's see, check it out. <laughs> now, same shit. Right. I had an appointment at I think if, I think I think at two o'clock I was supposed to meet with the niggas from eleven forty five, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Cause I got a new venue. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I wanna put them on. But um oh, that's crazy. That's the nigga I was supposed to meet. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm saying, oh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, and he 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 canceled it because he had to do something else. But instead of just sitting there idle, I'm like, well, fuck it. I got two more other things that I could be doing, and I went and did them shits, and right. then came back to my six o'clock meeting, and then went to that meeting, and then came here. That's my day. My day be like, bong, 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 and it's sad because I tell niggas, the trade off is time with your family. Yeah. Like, as much as I want to watch my daughter grow up and I want to be there for shit, if I don't go outside and get it, then what the fuck she going to have? Right. My daughter in private school, bro. That shit cost me $2,000 a month. She's in her, going into her six years. So I let you know, like, I pay 20000 a year for the last six years. I'm on 120 dollars I done paid for my daughter to go to school so far. 
I still got three more years left, and that's all I give a fuck about. Yeah. Is her finishing that shit at the same time taking care of the house. Yeah. Yeah, and my moms. My fucking moms had an aneurysm, bro. Big as a fucking tennis ball in her mm. head. Now she got a shit in her head, the stint, mm. closing it up. And when, when my grandfather, my, my whole family lived with my grandmoms and my grandfather. My grandfather, my uncle gave my grandmother the house. When my grandfather died, my uncle kicked us all out. Mm. We lived in the brownstone since I was nine years old. At the age of 35, my family had to move to the project for the first time. And I went up top to do a show. And um, I picked my moms up and drove around with her. When I dropped her off back to the crib, right before I left, she pulled me to the side and she said, get me out of here, please. Bro, when I say, I didn't do it in front of her, but when I got in that car, I cried so hard. Do you understand how it felt two years ago when I put that money in the account and got her the fuck out of there? Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Like, that's why the fuck I do this shit. I do this shit so that somebody in the family could be the help. I grew up in poverty, not necessarily fucked up. Like we was, I never, I didn't even know I was poor until I moved to Atlanta. Cause <laughs> we lived in a house with yeah. old mad adults. There's five adults and um, at the time, two children. It was six adults. There was eight of us, six adults and two children. I was one of the children. And we didn't have shit. It looked like we did because all them adults was chipping in. Yeah. But we really, like, nobody could stand on their own type shit. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? So my vow was to always be that nigga to do that. Like, I was going to one day make it. And my mom used to tell you, I was grinding, grinding, trying, calling home, trying to borrow $100, $200. I was homeless, sleeping on martyr, stealing from Home Depot to return it to eat, sleeping in the broom closet of the Clark three years before I even attended the school. You feel what I'm saying? Like, so to be 44 years old, to be able to get a call from my, my little cousin who's also my goddaughter, yo, somebody broke my car window, can you help me? And for me to be able to send that money, or for my moms to call me like, yo, I'm supposed to move down here, but I fucked my money up, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And to be able to pay for her crib and pay for her to come and pay to you all to bring her shit, along with my aunt and along with my cousins, nigga, that's my accolades. Mm -hmm. That's the shit that I sleep well at night and I smile when I think about it. Like dead ass, I'm sitting in my house chilling and I might just bust a smile, nigga, because I was able to take my family out to dinner or my mom's birthday came and I was able to really buy her a real birthday gift and shit like that. Like that's all I give a fuck about. And for niggas that don't understand that, that think this shit is a game, that just keep playing and keep trying, like you tell them to come on time and they late or they don't come with what they said they gonna come with or like nigga, nigga, like, nigga this shit ain't no game. Nah. This shit ain't no game because this shit ain't even about me. I could have sat on my fucking couch and sold weed and chill for the rest of my life. I was really good at it. Mm -hmm. I just sat down and chill. I make it. I made enough money. My sister-in-law done sold thirty million records. My house paid off. Mm -hmm. I could just sit back and chill and smoke and watch TV. I get up every day because all my little cousins is gonna be somebody if I got anything to do with it. Every last one of them. I intend on paying for school. I intend on paying for whatever the fuck. Weddings, whatever the fuck. If you ain't got no daddy around, you do now. And that's just straight up. Nah. Nah, it's like the interesting thing. It just brings me back to another, uh, I think it was Jay-Z quote, like, I mean, to be Jay-Z, now you had to be Jay Z then to be Jay Z now. Like it's like people see the end results and want that. They want the destination, but not the journey. 
Like, nigga, they don't want to do the work. I used to hand out flyers till I had callus on my feet. Yeah. Dead ass, dead Same ass. I, I worked for Grand Hustle. I worked for motherfucking um, um, corporate thugs. I worked for everybody, nigga. Everybody. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I never got no accolades. Juice, rest in peace, BMF. I was the fucking marketing guy. Mm-hmm. Putting up stickers where everybody sleeping, posters and shit like that. Mm-hmm. Nigga, wake up whole city lace. Straight up. And I wish, rest in peace, I wish she was alive even to see where I'm at now type shit. Because, you know, the people that I, I, I put, I always give accolades to the niggas that helped me. There's six people in this world outside of my moms and family and shit that I, I think if you call, if they call me right now tell me they got issues, nigga. I'm, I'm pulling up and I'm going to risk it for that person. Rest in peace, Juice. My boy Green Eyes that used to own the barbershop on Clark Campus, but now it's on Morehouse Campus. My boy Galley that owned Blue Cantina. Okay. Motherfucking um, Big Mike that owned Zari Lounge. Mm-hmm. And motherfucking my boy Manu that used to own Kiss Lounge. Okay. And Big Meech. Mm-hmm. Them six motherfuckers is the reason I am who I am today. Point blank period. Them niggas saw something in me and helped me out along the way. Straight up. And so I can't, I'm never gonna say I ain't have no help. You know what I mean? It wasn't what a lot of people get, but you know, Green Eyes helped me throw my first party. Juice had me on a road with her with D4L and the Throwback Boys before them niggas was even out. Mm-hmm. Motherfucking Big Meech had me standing next to him every single night when I was at the club. That nigga would be like, shorty, come stand next to me. And Juice was like, yo, that nigga like you. And once watching this TV show mm-hmm. made me realize that nigga saw, saw my, him in, in me. Pause. You feel what I'm saying? Because I was 23. I never took a dime from them niggas. I fucking had my own bottle. I had red bottle. They had gold bottles. Mm-hmm. I was like, I made sure I separated myself even though I was hanging out. And he saw that. And he saw that I didn't want nothing from nobody and I wanted to get it on my own. And that nigga Big Meats really fucked with me, yo. No, like straight up. And motherfucking um, Galley and, and my boy Walt, them two niggas, they, they was outside. Mm-hmm. And they was holding me down. Straight up, they was making sure I was I was a, a good, and them niggas ain't know me like that. They just took an interest because I was that young, energetic nigga. Straight up, so like them them is the, the six motherfuckers in this world that if any them niggas could call me right now, I'm doing this interview. I'm like, alright, son, I gotta go. Yeah. Straight up. Yeah, and it's like so like just kind of bringing it out to a close is like I think that's really. It is like talk about the culture, and I think it's like the the music or the streets or just all these different things. But ultimately, it's the thing between us as people is whatever the medium is. It the culture, the food. And, art it's like anything but it's uh, it's the connection between us as people and so like with the everything that we've talked about and with those those six people like you have those six people that fear, that you have but then you also have people who would have you in their six mm-hmm and it's just like with the things, like even looking at with Bonfire, with the organization that y'all run, those people that, like how you're that person for your household, like employing X amount of people and them being able to be those people for their households mm-hmm. and the different artists that come in and perform and the artists that like really like Bonfire, like cause Bonfire, like to, to do Bonfire is a thing. Is like it's like it's it's on the checklist. You feel me? Of like like of what though? Like I, I always talk to artists about like the small victories. Like that that ain't small. Is like we always look at the Grammys and all this stuff. And like nigga, be at the gas station one time with someone else pull up playing your music. 
That shit will light your fucking oh, heart. Oh, nigga, I didn't like that. <laughs> I was in Brooklyn chilling, and a nigga was riding past playing my shit, bro. Well, this is when I was here living here. Yeah. I went up there to visit and was giving out my CD. Then I came back the next week and with a thousand of them. Right. And I gave them shits out in the hood late night. It's when I'm running up on niggas with the hoodie on. They shook. I'm like, yeah, nah. And I guess <laughs> niggas don't give out free shit in Brooklyn. Yeah. And niggas was like, oh, shit, word, son, for me. Dead ass. Now I'm standing on the block chilling. I hear niggas ride past niggas. That shit was the best feeling in the world. Yeah. My man caught me like, son, niggas is up here playing your shit. Yeah. I'm like, what? I'm like, damn, man. But I say this much, bro. I just pray that I'm cognitive at my funeral. Mm -hmm. I pray that wherever my spirit is, that I'm able to look down because nobody really going to know the amount of shit I did for people until yeah. that day. Because I'm not going to talk about it. You feel what I'm saying? And, you know, unless the people talk about it, but, like, bro, it's motherfuckers that I helped become millionaires even before, way before the bonfire shit. I told you I was handing out niggas flyers, sticking up niggas posters, doing all that shit. But then the amount of niggas that I, even even just my phone, I got over 10,000 numbers in my phone, and nigga called me like, yo, son, I need da 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 da, -da. I don't wait to call the person for you. I'll do that shit right there, because I got a bad memory. The one thing that we didn't touch on, just to leave off, I have a terminal illness mm. called APS. Antiphospholipid syndrome. It's the cousin of lupus. Mm. You feel what I'm saying? I, I had a pulmonary embolism three years ago. I was supposed to die, and I'm, I get blood clots, so I gotta take blood thinners for the rest of my life. So motherfucker don't really even understand why I'm moving like I move. Like I just want to leave some good shit. The niggas told me that if I don't take them blood thinners for the rest of my life, I got six years to live. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. So at the end of the day, bro, when I get up in the morning. You know, I thank God that, number one, I just lost 46 pounds. I'm in shape. I'm healthy. I work out. I'm managing my illness. And I'm doing that, all of that just to stay around for my daughter and to leave a legacy for my family. That's all I give a fuck about. So, you know what I mean? When the shit to be crazy when you're trying to do something with somebody and they got this wall and they're like, I don't know because this nigga might, this nigga might. Like, bro, I'm not. I'm not because, nigga, I don't have, and not like, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to even enjoy this shit if I shit on you. You know what I mean? Who knows? I might die tomorrow type shit. So my whole shit is to leave something good, to leave a name that's good and to leave fucking a body of work that can represent my family, my close friends, and people that's involved in whatever I got going on. Legacy. A legacy. You feel what I'm saying? And that's it. And I just wish, I just hope more people see this interview so they can understand and know, and even when it comes to everybody I spoke to, from the city to even like Asia A, mm -hmm. I hope she see this shit because she's dope. And she just need to know the shit that's going to hold her back. You know what I mean? Because I really want to see, like, if I came in contact with you and I had a pleasant experience, even if we had a tumultuous one in the beginning, if we wind up in a pleasant mode, yo, even if those are I got issues with, I be feeling like, yo, if them niggas was winning, them niggas wouldn't have no issue with me. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? Because them niggas would be too busy winning. Yeah. So I really, I just want to see niggas get what they deserve. I want to see niggas get what they work for because it's so, it is so many people who work for shit and don't never get their accolades because of the gatekeepers and the haters and the shit like that. I just wish that niggas got what they, what they deserve and what they work for because it would be less bullshit. I promise you. Facts. Like straight up. Like that's, and that's kind of like what I've tried to do with the brand. Like my whole thing with like the way that we do the features with the, my whole thing with like is like trying to eliminate the gatekeepers but still maintain the culture. Like so that was the whole thing with everything we do. That's what the membership was about for me. Like when I started, it's like I got I gotta stay in business. <laughs> like I ain't gonna help nobody if I'm out of business. And so, but at the same time, I don't want you to have to pay for an article. 
I don't want you to have to pay to get on this stage. I don't want you to have to pay for this mixtape placement. I want to be able to take you as a gospel artist with a dope song and put it on World Star. I want to be able to put 15 people on stage for free during South by. I want because you got good music. And it's like just all of these things to be able to do all of these things. Like, like we live in the world. Shit, the world takes money. Like, and so it's like in our space, and it go to like some of the stuff you was talking about earlier, just the programming of us. Like getting money, like if you're getting too much money or you the people feel like you're getting too much money or you, shit, you just getting some of their money, then they got a problem with it. Oh you. yeah, they got a problem. <laughs> it's the devil's work all of a sudden. Like, and so to 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 your point, like just like with all of this stuff that's going on, like with um with legacy. Like I think that's for me a much like bro, like a lot of like a lot of what you're talking resonates with me because like that's for me that's like being able to have impact. Like and I know like um just we didn't help so many people out. Like just yeah, like so many people and it's like a similar thing is like like and I I love what you said about I wanna just be cognitive at my funeral. And it's like cause we're just having this Maybe it was like last year, just the um, the thought that like everybody shows so much love when you die, nigga, yeah, because yeah. they can't admit to the things that you do while you alive. I've never wrote a rap and it wasn't about real life. And in my one of my shits, I said I help so many people that they think it's normal. Ignore the pressure. Fuck if I'm doing fine. Ignore the effort. Any little problem of mine is a sort of second, and I damn near got to be dying for them to check in. Mm -hmm. Fuck a check in. I don't need it. Born alone, expect to be the same when I'm leaving. That's life. If my family's straight, it had meaning. Till then, get the fuck out of my face while I'm eating. <laughs> 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 straight up. Like, that I, nigga, I, I know niggas don't even get the magnitude of, they don't even get how much they've been helped. Like, yeah. that person I was telling you about, she don't get how much she been helped. Like, you was 23, making $60,000 a year. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Like, that's how I, that's how I go, bro. Um, all I know is I'm going to keep moving how I move. When I was 33, because I, 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 I'm, I'm, my family's Geechee. What? Yeah. South Carolina. Mm -hmm. St. Helena Island. My people. Yeah, my my, my <laughs> Yeah, my family from Johnston, Charleston, Saluda, all okay. through South Carolina. And um, I so have, you probably cousin, nigga. That's why we. <laughs> yeah, I got nine hundred cousins in the no, state. No, I got we got it's uh some canics up in New York. Yeah, nine hundred cousins in the south. That's yeah. what ancestry said. But I um, what niggas don't understand is I get visions, mm. like real visions. I'm talking about nigga. I done woke up with whole sixteens, like and able to write down my dream. Mm -hmm. Like, like straight up, like, what was the what one shit I said? I said, um, I don't remember it. I remember it later. But anyway, but I woke up with four commandments God gave me. He said, help as many people as possible. Try not to hurt nobody. Try not to hurt yourself and be better than you was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if even if you live in the projects, paint your shit. Fix your floor, fix your door, fix your, make sure you got the flyers crib in that motherfucker until it's time for you to move out to something bigger and better. Mm -hmm. But every day you should be getting up trying to do something better for yourself and for your peoples. You feel what I'm saying? Like, and that, and that's the that's just the the way I the way I live, man. I, I try my best to wake up and make improvements to my life and the people around me every day. Every single day. You know. I have issues with people I do business with, whether it's my partners or whatever, just trying to show them, like, bro, you ain't got to be greedy to get it. When you got you, it's so hard to find a team that's willing to put in the same amount of work you put in. Yeah. And when you got that, bro, you got to cherish that and take care of that. You don't get a team and then go do some, some underhanded shit to benefit yourself when it's your team is involved, and you could have extended it to benefit everybody, but you took the liberty to do it on just for you yeah. type shit. I'm not like that. Like, my, my sister-in-law, when we was going through COVID, 
niggas try to steal Bonfire, you know what I mean? Cause we was just trying to figure out how to make it a business and make it real. And niggas tried to take it and tried to trademark and tried to do all that shit. And we fought and we won. But at the time, my sister-in-law, the country music singer, hit me up. I was like, yeah, I'm going to buy you a building. I'm tired of what you're going through. And da 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 And she said, but it's yours. She said, it's, she said, it's not your partner's. It's yours. You, they can operate out of there, but it's yours. And knowing how much we put in and how much work we put in, I said, no. She said, what you talking about? I was like, if I can't share it with them, I don't want it. You feel what I'm saying? And I just wish, because they a little younger than me. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? I just wish they understood that part. They, they really got that, like, yo, bro, we are really, really, really stronger together in all that we do that surrounds what we do. Like, I ain't expecting you to open a beauty salon with me. I ain't expecting you to motherfucking trade stocks with me. But nigga, we throw parties. Why would I get a event facility and not include the niggas that I made history with? You feel what I'm saying? And that's, that's it's what I want to educate people on is like, Remove greed and all those other fucking negative traits from your soul and start moving more righteous when it comes to the people around you that you know got your back. Stop making it where it's just you and it's all about just you because it's going to bite you in the ass later. Yeah. It will, I promise you, bro. Like, when you got a team and you ain't teaming, <laughs> yeah. you're going to sit back and, and watch that team flourish without you one day. And that, you know what I mean? And that's what the, I just hope this interview, that's why I was so eager to take it, because I knew you were going to ask the real questions. And I'm eager for the world to kind of get to know me. Yeah. Because, man... If niggas only knew how I really thought and how I really like move, and shit, I have never like right now we doing business with somebody that was trying to do business with us four years ago and he wasn't in a good position, like literally a very bad position to where his negative blowback would have fuck around and hit us too. Yeah. And you know, we wind up spinning the block and we fucking with him and you know, he had this perception of who we are based off of, you know, haters gonna find other haters. Yeah. And that's just they like neck like e immediately, if you don't like somebody, it's so easy to find somebody that don't like them and it's click up. Joke about that like in school is like no quicker way for two girls to become friends than to find a bitch they both don't like. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? So this man had this perception of us. And particularly me, because like you said, I'm the face of this shit, and yeah. I, I take a lot of the meetings. And at the end of our first conversation, that nigga grabbed my hand and prayed with me. And then that nigga said, I don't care what I got to do, we're going to do business together because I like who you are. And I just be trying to like show niggas like, bro, you really like... Especially like people who don't get their way sometimes, and then they get. I'll give you a prime example. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. Um, the shorty who owned our bar, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I started a thing called Bonfire University. I got the Instagram page, did the logo, all of that shit. In 2018, it was. And um, I did one event and then kind of put it on the back burner because we was nurturing bonfire. Right. So when we got you know, to a point to where we at now, we had a showcase called All The Smoke. Now we let one of our partners go a couple years ago over some bullshit and he had a showcase called, um, called um, Takeoff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we called Takeoff. So my partner was mad because when we let him go, you know, the nigga went in our account and took like nine grand and some more shit. And we, we didn't, we didn't even fall because he did it on Memorial Weekend. So we was going to make 40 grand anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fuck it. You left with the money, but my partner was mad because nobody take from him. And 
he started his own show. He started a showcase of our own, and it was based off of hate. Mm -hmm. It was the same day as his. We even called it All the Smoke, because mm -hmm. we wanted all the smoke. <laughs> and the shit didn't do good right. for a whole year. So I came to that nigga, and I was like, bro, the reason why it's not doing good, we built it off of hate. I was like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to move it to a Wednesday instead of Tuesday, and we're going to call it Bonfire ATL University, where we teaching niggas how to motherfucking step their performances up and helping them with the music industry and shit like that. And when I went to launch it, Shorty got mad because she had started All Bar University, and she, was running, she was basically told her staff that they can't work for us if they work for her. Mm. So we lost like bartenders and motherfucking security and some more shit. Mm -hmm. And even when her trusted employee made her aware that um, we had the name first and we wasn't biting off, she never apologized. And she literally just showed her hand. She just don't fuck with niggas for whatever reason. And it's like, why? Who knows? But it be like that. I, I said I did over Benny the Butcher and what's the name B? What's the nigga name? Um, Freddie Gibbs mm -hmm. over they shit. I start. I said every day I hear I got beef with niggas I never met. I never even met Shorty. Mm. I've been in a room with her. She'd have been at my party. We have never been introduced to each other. I said every day I hear I got beef with niggas I never met. If your presence wasn't impressive, I'm not pressing to recollect. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. I'm suggesting you place a bet, because I ain't take an L yet. You can't put me in a box. They ain't made a sale yet. They try to crucify me. They ain't made a nail yet. To be honest, my next move kind of made me want to yell, check. Put a tag on you pussies like I'm trying to sell sex. I heard niggas line dancing, and I'm trying to yell, step. On myself from long range, because I'm trying to yell, step. But I'd rather yell, touchdown, and we both get a check. But checking my eyes ain't gonna get you out of debt. It's gonna only get you deeper. Cause now you gonna owe the reaper. When you a leader, you gonna know a leader. Nigga, you're not a leader. And you don't know me neither. So part of mine's the day's price now yesterday. I couldn't find a better day to update my resume. Smile. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up. The, it's like, the interesting thing is, in this conversation, it's like a verse for everything. <laughs> I rap about real life. I sit there. That is my outlet. I'm not. I'm black. I don't really be going to therapy like that. The only time I go to therapy is when I have a car accident and I get in there like, nigga, you know I ain't hurt. So we gonna talk about real shit, like straight up. But I write. I write. I write about, nigga. My writing be so, like, even if I'm, you know, how you get to the point, you be like, damn, I ain't write a rhyme in a long time. I need to write a rhyme. Right. So I know how to turn anything into a rap. I'm sitting in the crib one day, like, I need to write a rhyme. I'm high. I'm smoking. So this crown again is blunt. The rest in the closet. Bitch in the bed. Gun by the phone posits. <laughs> 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 like, like straight up. So I rap about real life 100%. I have never wrote an imaginary rap. Mm. Ever. Everything I rap about is what's going on. That's why I wish I could teach that to these kids, man. They ain't, you ain't got to spin the block and kill the ops every song, man. No. Rap about what With, the fuck you going through. And so that, and, and this comes to my, my thing, my full circle moment with making it. Like, when I started it, like I was saying, I wanted to teach the business. Like, that's all I didn't want to, I wasn't trying to be a tastemaker, none of that shit. And it got to, um, like, like, I, like, a lot of people didn't like me in the city. Like, because I, the magazine, I was giving away information that people were selling. So you pick up the magazine, it'd be 50 DJs in there, phone numbers, emails, all this stuff. It'd be like, this is where you go to get this done, and this is where you go, this is how you get your shit copywritten. Like, and so like, like brothers, like, things and like, just all kind of shit at events and all kind of stuff. But it's like um, 17 years, and it's like, like that, that, that frustration dealing with artists and like having to, Realize, like, yo, yeah, like, they don't think the way I think. That's what makes them artists. Like, I gotta appreciate them for what they do and then do what I do in the way to help. And so, like, that was just been teaching the business, business, business. And then, uh, like, 
I say like over the past two years, I've kind of been like looking and it's like the music, like everything's changed because like when I got in, they, everybody was hiding the business from the artists because mm -hmm. they was making Cause money. Because now the artists are the business. Now they shoving the business down the artists' throats mm -hmm. to the point where- Niggas can't even catch it. Niggas can't even just do music. Like, yeah, it's okay to do music. You gotta be a CEO. You love it. Yeah, you gotta be a CEO yeah. now. You gotta ha already have spins I was, and already have. You know what I mean? I just talked to an artist yesterday. I'm like, bro, like you can do, like you're good. You can, you know, you can just do music. Like, and it's like, it, it's but you okay. can't because they're not gonna fuck with you unless you already buzzing. The only way you gonna buzz is to already have business acumen and but get his, your shit here's spinning. Here's my thing. Here's my thing. Shit crazy. Like, bro, you got a job. Like. Why should you have to make money doing music if you've been doing music this long without making money? And it's like, it's like if you got a job, you take care of your stuff, bro. Like it's people who have, it's people who spend fifteen hundred dollars a month playing Xbox. It's people who spend seven, eight thousand dollars going to Vegas, knowing that I'm gonna lose this money. Maybe I win, but I'm this is what I can afford to lose. And it's like. Music, like if you if you're a real artist, you love making music, making a writing a record, like going to the beach, like like I, like. So if it's if it's that thing, if it's something that brings joy to your life, like in the amount of people I've seen that like quit doing music, quit doing something they enjoy because they can't turn it into a business, it'd be like saying I'm not going to the beach no more because I can't figure out how to sell hot dogs down there. So mm -hmm. it's like I never understood that. I never could. I can't stop doing music because it's literally part of who I am. Yeah. Like, I told you, I've been doing this shit since I was nine years old. I watched my friends become, Foxy Brown is my real friend, bro. I watched that bitch become a fucking superstar. Mm -hmm. You feel what I'm saying? That shit hurt, cause she used to come to me to have me battling niggas for her. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? And it was just like, but the reason why I never really got on, cause I, I got so many stories, bro. I was supposed to sign with Fat Boy Records, rest in peace, Archie Eversole. I was supposed to sign with fucking um, Jay-Z. I was supposed to sign with my man in New York. We was supposed to be the verses of Wu-Tang because I grew up across the street from the Jizzah. You okay. feel what I'm saying? So we was supposed to be the Manchu Warriors. <laughs> like, nigga, I've been rapping since I was a young nigga, and I've been nice. Like, when I was, nigga, I was even nicer when I was younger. I was, because I, you know, them young niggas, I got that, had that energy and had yeah. that shit on my mind. I was angry. But, you know, that's my therapy. Right. Like literally, like you hear, yeah, you say you gotta rap for everything. Yeah. yeah. Like nigga, I, I get, I sit down and I get mad. I said from the bag to the spoon to the light of that spark, once perfected, my uncle will inject it into his arm. To the class that I passed with an A, and then bring it to Mars, Jerry Springer on. Get the fuck out the way. I wasn't shit when grades slipped and they started to fade. When I arose, no one showed on graduation day. Had to make a way, nigga. I was poverty stricken, minority based, and chased by authority figures. When I'm front nines, clap for dime sacks. Two for one deal. Cause the killer get a 25 to L. I was born in the struggle, gotta hustle to survive. Create life at the oven. Ain't no custard on my pies. Mom's lost the ambition. She in the kitchen wishing that she had a man. I'm like, man, listen. I'm a provider by nature. I never had a dad. All I need is a pound, a pen and a pad. From the cradle to the stage, I've been through so much pain. And it's hard trying to maintain. I done tried smoke, tried liquor, but the pain remains. So now the pad and the pen, wash the pain away. Like, nigga, I write about my real fucking life. Shit that I've seen. I, I have the typical black family, bro. My grandmother was, was born into sharecropping. Mm. My Uncle got drafted into Vietnam. Mm. My other uncle, he, he became a heroin addict and died with hepatitis. My motherfucking other uncle worked at a hospital and they never told him to wear face masks and he caught cancer in his neck. And when he was about to get 30 million from them niggas for a lawsuit, they paid the lawyer to fuck his money up. And that nigga died with nothing. We had to pay for his funeral with a credit card. My grandfather, he didn't fill out his paperwork on his pension right because he was illiterate and he died with nothing. Like I have the typical fucking government shitted on black family, like straight up. And nigga, that shit over with. That shit over with because of me, point blank period. And I don't give a fuck. Like, 
I got a little weird shit going on. I got cousin that I was raised with that don't fuck with me no more. It's just all types of shit. But I let all that shit go yeah. because my goal is bigger than that. I even want to make sure he good. You feel what I'm saying? So that's who I am. For niggas who want to know who the fuck I am, that is literally you just got a damn near a hundred percent of me. The shit that you don't know is little dumb shit. <laughs> Straight yeah. up. I appreciate you coming through and being open and, and having a conversation and sharing, like, not just your story but your 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 point of view. And tell you, tell you one last thing because I got I like telling my cool stories. I talked about so much other shit. <laughs> it's a cool story. Okay. When I first moved out here. I was hanging out with my boy O, and we started a group called Crooked Figures. And we um we was rapping his brother, two brothers was our producer, our producers, and I was writing my raps and O raps, and then my other guy was writing his own raps. So his brother was producing for a major artist, um, mainly Divine Stevens. Mm -hmm. And his bro and um, his brother hit me like, yo, I need you to come write for my artist because you dope. So I was in the studio writing for Divine. And, you know, Divine is a pop-locking ass nigga. Yeah. So that nigga, I'm writing, this is 2000, so I'm writing <laughs> gangster raps. And yo, this, this nigga pop-locking in my raps. So I'm like, so I'm mad. I'm in Doppler. I'm in Doppler. I'm mad as fuck. But I ain't saying nothing because I want the opportunity. Yeah. So the producer comes out the back, the brother, and he like, yo, check out my shit. His shit was so hard that I quit. Pause, mm. no diddy. I quit. I said, yo, you need to put that nigga on. And I walked out. About a year later, Locked Up came out. Mm. Akon was the producer. Mm. Dead ass, yo. And that, nigga, and that nigga wound up putting Akon on. Devon put the money up. And mm -hmm. Akon is Akon today. Yeah. Like, straight up. But I walked the fuck out. Dead <laughs> ass. I was like, yo, this ain't going to work, bro. Put that nigga on. <laughs> That nigga music is dope. I had never heard, you know, when Akon yeah. first came out, he ain't never heard no shit like that before. Yeah. Nigga, an African rap singing over motherfucking dope ass yeah. beats. Like, yeah. that shit was, was different as fuck. And I got so many stories like that, nigga, from this city. We might have to, we might have to do it like a weekly podcast. Tell his tales. Yo, know, I got <laughs> so many. You understand something? I'm an only child, mm -hmm. and we was poor. Right. So I was outside. Yeah. I was outside, nigga. I knew Biggie. Mm -hmm. I knew Biggie. Foxy, believe it or not, Foxy and Biggie was so cool that before we even knew the bitch rap, she was like, call my motherfucking house. And that nigga Biggie was motherfucking on her answer machine rapping about her and her brother Gavin. Inga mm -hmm. and Gavin not home. He didn't leave the message at the time. I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit, nigga. That's fucking big. And then when she finally got on, she pulled up at the school. She's like, T, go outside. I got a surprise for you. And it was fucking Biggie. Mm -hmm. And then one day it was Nas. I, got, I got, remember I said I was at the Survival of the Illest concert? Yes. Chat line. Went to go see some bitches in Harlem. Me and my nigga standing in Harlem. The chicks didn't like my nigga because he was an ug mug nigga. We <laughs> arguing on the corner. White Benz pull up. Window roll down. It's AZ and Foxy Brown. Mm -hmm. And she go, yo, what you doing on the corner, T? Fucking with these bum ass bitches. <laughs> and then she was like, yo, we having a concert across the street. Come to the back. I got you. And that's how I got even in the concert for, mm. for uh, Eric Sermon Bodyguard to see me. Yeah. Wound up being Jay Z first cousin, all that shit. Yeah. Man. Like dead ass. But I've been in some ill situations man. in my life. See, listen. The real MVP in that situation was them ugly bum ass bitches. Had you not been fucking with them, I wouldn't have been <laughs> up there, son. I wouldn't have been up there. And I wouldn't have had no stories to tell, <laughs> nigga. I like. Dead ass. I, I, when I say, bro, I'm in South Carolina in 2010. My nigga have a party in the fucking bumblefuck country. We in the party. It's my nigga party. We in the party. Fucked up. This nigga DMX comes in out of nowhere. We in the bumblefuck South Carolina. We in Spartanburg in the woods in a club, bro. Yeah. This nigga DMX walks in the club, hangs out with niggas all night, drunk, we wildin'. We, at the, it's the night is over. Yeah. We cleaning up the club. This nigga X goes, yo, dog, I'm going to let y'all know how real a nigga I am. I'm going to help y'all niggas clean up. <laughs> Dead ass, that nigga was sweeping and mopping the fucking floor and shit like that. I can't make this shit up, but this is the life that I've led, nigga. When I say I done had some dope ass experiences, like I hung out with Jay-Z 
before I even was going to sign to him, a Funkmaster Flex six-year anniversary party for the tunnel. Mm -hmm. Like, just wound up running into Jay-Z. He buying a bunch of drinks for girls and kicking it with that nigga. Nas, I fucking... My man see me out of nowhere. He like, yo, come hang out with us tonight. I go in an opera to an all-white kids party. Mm -hmm. And it's me, him, Juan Farmer, you know Juan, yeah. and Nas in a section. It's just us four in a section, motherfucker, hanging out all night. Straight up. Like, I done had some, some great experiences in my life, bro. And those experiences have shaped me to be who I am on an intimate level with so many different prominent people. You feel what I'm saying? And got to have real conversations and get real advice. And like my sister-in-law, like, nigga, I done hung out with John Mayer. I done met Maroon 5. I done, Kenny Chesney know me by first name. Like, yeah. it, it, but you going to see me in the hood on MLK chilling and never know none of that shit. And I love it like that, man. And I've always been like that. I'm, I'm, I'm able to walk in an office building and talk to that man directly and get that point across, and I'm able to stand in any hood and hang with the motherfucking homies. Right. Like, and I love that shit, bro. Like, I, I had a great life, and it's still getting better. You know what I mean? I love Duality. my wife. Duality. Yeah, I love my wife, bro. Like, I've been with her for 20 years. We are, you would think we were totally, she's a little white girl from South Georgia. Straight up, country, country, country ass voice. And I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and people who see us together be like, what the fuck? <laughs> Straight up. But we've been together for 20 years. Like, straight up. I, w I wanna ask you something. I think this is gonna be like the B side of this. Go ahead. Because it's like. Ask it. The, um, the hustle and the focus being married like having like when you're in a committed relationship how like because it's like what what i'm i'm increasingly kind of noticing is like i've been married 17 years and so like like with dealing with people like people a lot of people did not know i was married like because my wife stay at home like mm -hmm. and she's just recently started coming out with the business and doing stuff like maybe in the past four or five years um but it's like when you're young and you single and you 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 trying to impress people and doing like you worried about a whole nother set of things. So you 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 spending money recklessly, you doing stuff, you doing bad things. It costs things money to be outside. Because you because you trying to impress. And you and like the people like we were talking about earlier who like, yo, I can't take an L. Like, like, so everybody gotta lose so I can make it look like a win. And so, like, how, how being in a relationship and being married has played into um, your hustle and, and the way that you conduct business. My wife stuff. is the absolute best, bro. She's been down with my hustle since I was hustling in the hood, selling with the fucking drug, bro. She's been right there next to me, fucking willing to motherfucking bag some shit up and get that shit off and straight up. Like, it, there's never nothing I came up with that she wasn't willing to assist me with or help me down. And she understood and being from where she from and having this family with school teacher and a country music singer, you would never think my wife lived in the hood and the trap. We lived in the bluff, nigga. Straight up, and I was hustling and talking about she sleeping on top of AK 47s and shit like that. You would never think that this is the reason, this is why I fuck with my wife. My little cousin was a stick up kid. He stuck up a prominent motherfucker. I ain't even gonna incriminate him, say no name. And he went to New York with the jury on to pawn it to Jacob the jeweler. And Jacob wasn't open on the weekend. He had to wait till Monday. Stupid nigga wearing this shit wound up getting motherfucking robbed himself for the same shit he just robbed a nigga for. He called me. I was mad because I told him to take this shit off his neck because niggas was calling me from the hood like, yeah, your cousin out here wilding. And he didn't want to listen. And fucking, he called me at 6 o'clock. I'm getting my hair cut for the club. Yo niggas lying me. I'm like, I hung up, I was mad, because I told him to take the shit off. But then he called me at six in the morning when I was mm -hmm. coming in from the club and said, I know who it is. And there was some niggas that used to bully me when I was little. 
and I really didn't like them niggas. I was like, oh, now they fucking with my little cousin. I came in the house at six in the morning. She was laying in the bed. I started loading up weapons, and I said, come on, we out. And she said, where we going? I said, New York. She said, okay. Got up, got in the car, drove the entire way there, went in my house, met my family for the first time. We, I, I was outside for eight hours trying to get active, mm. came back in the house. She drove all the way back. Mm. We was only in New York for eight hours in my car, nigga. <laughs> that day I came back, I said, I'm fucking with this motherfucker right here. Bottom mm. line. And I've been with her ever since, my guy. And I'm not going to act like when we was dating, I was an angel and wasn't doing shit and all that. And you know, when you get in this relationship and y'all start getting older and you start looking at your spouse and you start looking at these young bitches out here in the street and you're like, man, I'm trying to see what that's about and all that. I could truthfully say I fell back in love with my wife last year. Just watching her work hard, take care of my daughter, and she took care of herself. And, you know, all the shit that we look at women for, like bodies and hair and face, I watched her work on herself, and she is the kind of woman that I would look at in the street. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that made me... That strengthened everything that I'm talking about now, strengthened us and got me to a better place of where I'm actually happy after 20 years, even more happy than I was probably when I got married. Mm -hmm. Like, I still, I'll be staring at her like mm -hmm. she a regular motherfucker in the street. I'll be like looking like, damn, yo, okay, see yeah. you, yo. <laughs> like, he's like, straight up, like... Like, marriage helped me out a whole lot. It grounded me. It gave me a real partner that's willing to really chip in and do the work. I own an Airbnb. I said, me and my wife clean that shit. Mm -hmm. and she, she's the director of her fucking job. She's the, she, she works for a, a commercial um, textile company. Mm -hmm. And she's the director. She has employees in different states. She got to fly out. But she just finished doing the sheets and making the beds for the Airbnb. Somebody check in on Saturday. That kind of assistance and that kind of motherfucking she, energy of knowing that I need help and willing to give that help and that help transitions into profit, yeah. that shit is priceless, bro. And no matter what, I ain't going nowhere. No matter what, I don't give a fuck. Like, and that's just straight up. Yeah. Nah, like, that's that's... I think that it, it, it's so corny because <laughs> you don't get it until you get it. You don't it's get like, it until you get like, it. Because like, like, because this is so corny. But now, like, and and when you get here, then you realize how corny the other shit was. It took so long, though, bro. Even being married, I'm looking for other shit. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? I'm seeing the, the fat asses in the in the. You know what I mean? But once you once you take the time Bluetooth to step back, Bluetooth. <laughs> once you take the time to step back and actually like realize what you got, yeah. Like nigga, I told you I moved down here with one hundred and fifty dollars and three outfits on the run, sleeping on broom closets, trains, all that. We got two houses, six cars. I own about five businesses. She's the director of her job. My daughter in private school. Nigga, I wouldn't throw that shit away for nothing, my guy. Because that shit is literally the end result of hustle and struggle. Mm -hmm. and, and the history that we got, the memories we got. You know, me and her, when we were both in college at the same time, this is what our day used to look like. I used to have to get up in the morning, drive her to work. Drive my, all the way up from the West End to Avondale Estates. Mm -hmm. Then drive myself from Avondale Estates to Dunwoody to school. Then come back and get her from work. Then drive her from work to Buckhead to school. Then wait, come back and get her from motherfucking school. Then come home and do homework. We did that shit until both of us graduated. Straight up and down. 
I wouldn't trade that shit for nothing, my God. Just the memory. That's a crazy-ass commute. Cause, nigga, we was doing 125 <laughs> miles a day. We was doing none of them shits is close. Dunwoody, yeah, the Stone the, Mountain. And the, and the way the highways are down here, them shits is like... Ow, ow, yeah, ow. Like, we, this is I'm every like, day. Yeah. We did this shit until I walked down the aisle, she walked down the aisle, and then I walked two more times. Yeah. But dead ass, bro, like, we, 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 we was out. I think I used to have to buy an ounce, overdraft my bank account, try to put the money back in by 12, not to get an overdraft fee, mm-hmm. and do the same shit just for us to eat and pay bills. Straight up. So... Like, yeah. nigga, yes. Uh, like, how has that shit changed my life, being married, or even just being with her, period? That shit is everything in my life. Yeah. That shit changed everything. When she came around, nigga, I had a teammate. Mm-hmm. Straight up. Nah, I did, and that's why I wanted to, I definitely wanted to touch on that. Uh, you see my shirt, nigga. <laughs> We'll catch a case. Hot <laughs> wife. She made this from Christmas. <laughs> it was so funny. I wore that shit the whole fucking day. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, but that and that and you know, like I said, like the um, it it's it ain't like bringing it back to close on the music. It ain't just the music, like that makes success. It's like it's it's the people. It's all these different things. It's having that support system, having the friends, having the, all of that stuff. And so like, I definitely wanted to definitely get your, your thoughts on, and, and point of view on that because I know it's like, a, like that's a popular thing. Um, like going back to what we said earlier, just like uh, with the situation with ATL Top 20 and like, it's like a lot of uh, the negative stuff gets engagement, even, and one of the things I watch, but and um, like with ATL Top Twenty, the page posts a lot of negative stuff. But if you read the caption, it's not negative. It just invites negativity. It allows like, hey, it presents a thing and allows people to be people. And so it's just like with with so much of that going on, and it's like all these gender wars and all this. I can't go half, and I need to this, and I need that. Just the the fact of like where we are, like me being able to like man, in seventeen years, you twenty years, like it's like how that how much of a difference, uh, like chasing your dreams and chasing these goals and doing this thing and creating legacy, how much easier it is with assistance, man. Just somebody that, that give a fuck just as much as you do. Yeah. That shit is priceless, bro. I ain't even gonna lie. Like, and it's crazy because, you know, the 80 20 rule, bro. Yeah. You know what I mean? You fuck around and you get a woman that got 80% of the shit you want. And she don't got that 20 and it irks you. And yeah. you go find a chick that got the 20 and you trade off. You got, I got my 20. But then you realize you just lost 80. Yeah. You feel what I'm saying? Like, and, and to the women, yo, don't get mad. Sometimes a nigga has to go see. Yeah. Like, sometimes you got to go see. Like, even being together 20 years, my nigga, 20 years is a long time. You yeah. start, like, even with my wife, I would never get mad if I found out my wife did some bullshit. Because yeah. I'm like, this bitch been with me for 20 years. That's what I'm about to say. And the <laughs> inverse. Because we saying for the guy, but it's the inverse too. Like, yeah, you've been with me for 20 <laughs> years. You might want to find something out. You might, that might just been a test. Like, let me see if I still fuck with my husband. You came home. Yeah. You cleaned up. You cooked. You did all that shit. I, ain't, I never checked my wife phone, bro. Yeah. I don't get it. Like, straight up. Because at the end of the day, as long as you come home and I don't feel no difference in the way you loving me, I ain't looking at your shit at all. Yeah. Like, so I ain't even looking at it then. I'm just going to be like, I ain't fucking dead. I'm going to do me. <laughs> you fucking me. Straight up. But I, I, like, my wife is the best thing that ever happened to me, man. Because I get to bounce intelligence off of her. You know, it ain't just that she a pretty face or that she's there holding me down. Like, I used to host a political talk show for four years. Mm. I had a million listeners. 
And I'm real serious about that kind of shit. Like, yeah. you know, I got into the Bill Gates spill and yeah. all that. Like, I sit and and by the time I ended that show, she was my co-host. Yeah. Cause, cause, uh, cause she give a fuck just like I give a fuck, and we have, and we are totally different. Right. I am a, I am a moderate um, conservative, <laughs> and my wife is a diehard liberal. liberal. <laughs> diehard liberal. I, listen, I had expected that. Like <laughs> everything liberal, bro. She is gay rights, motherfucking border, no border patrol, no. She don't give a fuck, and I give too much of a fuck. And but we we debate like a motherfucker. We even have real arguments and all that shit. But I appreciate that shit because yeah. I know I ain't talking to a dummy. Right. And I just straight up and, and it strengthens my mind not yeah. to be sitting there talking about Drake and Kendrick all day. Like yeah. we talk about it. You know what I mean? She with me with the Drake shit. She like I don't understand. I love Drake. <laughs> I've never gotten a car. I'm lying. After the f- second week of his album dropping, I have never got in the car and said, yo, throw that Kendrick on. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to keep it real. I, I don't, I've never listened to a Drake album all the way through. Uh, but see, that's the whole thing. As much as I fuck with him, me neither. Some of yeah. the shit I can't fuck with. It's just like, I he get too singy. Get too- what was it? Scorpion. I tried to listen to Scorpion. I was like, when they Scorpion drop, I'm listening to it because it's like, he submitted. Let me lease. And I've never knocked him. Like, he always got bops. So I was like, I'm going to listen to an album. And then that shit was a double disc? And, was like, and I didn't realize it, it until boring, I was bro. like 8 in. I was like, nah, nigga, nah. <laughs> it get boring. It get boring. But, 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 but he'll have like two or three Whatever joints Whatever the singles there. are. he had two or three joints up there. Yeah. The rest of that shit is for the ladies. Yeah. Bro. Like, straight up. But. I, I don't know. I just always been a defender of somebody I felt was getting bullied, even yes. in high school. Like, I was the nigga. And I put a crew together. They became bullies, and I wound up fighting my whole crew that I put together over this random nigga. You know what? I think what it is is Drake has always been the bully. Drake has been the mean girl in the industry for, like, 10 years. Mm-hmm. And so it was the it was the comeuppance. That's what I think... Because, like, the mean girl, everybody, because she cute and she popular, so everybody is good with whatever. But the second she catch them hands, like, yeah, don't make me go get Sarah. Like, <laughs> so that's, I think that's really what it was, is that, because, you know, he, he always taking the subs, and he, nah, you didn't just. Man, yeah. I'm going to keep it real, bro. I ain't going to lie. That beef made me so mad. I <laughs> wish that I was on on so I could give it to Kendrick. <laughs> I wanted to give it to that nigga so bad because I don't give a fuck. And I will say this live. That nigga can't out-rap me. I don't give a fuck. Like, he ain't even had enough history in his life to even begin to try to out-rap me, yo. Like, straight up. And I ain't going to front. Some of that nigga should be boring to me, man. I I get it. You want to make motivating music. But it's like, God damn, nigga. Like, what what my nigga Drake say? He's trying to free the slaves every song? (laughs) (laughs) Like, God damn, nigga. I just want to... You know what I mean? It, yeah, a lot of, we, we talk about like the difference between entertainment and art is like Kendrick makes art that ain't always entertaining. Yeah. So, like that Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers was art. Like like you listen to it all the way through, like yo, the way you put it together, what you went into, it's like, y'all, man, this shit deep. Yeah, and I went and listened to that shit and that shit bored the fuck out but, of me, bro. But, but that's the thing, I'm not returning to it. Yeah, like that shit bored I, 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 I heard out it. Of me. Like it's like a book. I read the book. I'm not rereading the book. Like, <laughs> like that. Like, like you feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Like that shit just. I'm like, man, I, you can rap, bro, but God damn, you ain't got to like God. <laughs> damn, what the fuck, my nigga? That's that, that's what I get when I listen to Kendrick. I be like, come on, man, can I get this? Like, like even the shit he just dropped, dissing Drake. I'm like, about time, nigga. Yeah. That's an actual joint. Like, that'll make me want to listen to the B-side shit. Because right. like, at least I got this. So let me hear it up. But your whole album can't be like that, bro. And then, like, you just get all the Grammys because, because you doing that shit. Like, come on, son. There's other niggas out there rapping, too. Like, come on, son. Man, you can't have it both ways. Though. Kendrick just opened his mouth. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> hand him a Grammy right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the way I feel, bro. I, I would love, I would love to engage that nigga just because so many niggas on his dick because they ain't used to raps. Yeah, they ain't used to raps no more. Oh my god, he kicked lyrical raps. That shit is amazing. 
Uh, that shit alright, bro. It's like the Caitlyn Clark stuff. Yeah. Like, like. Nah, that bitch be amazing. No, bro. no, no. I'm, I'm talking say. about they talking like that. They playing rough and like, no, that's no, that's, that's how they like, play. You just are watching it. Like you just for the first time. Yeah, you ain't seen. Yeah, you ain't no WNBA basketball. fan. Yeah. They, motherfuckers, they harder than the men. They gotta yeah. be all the time. <laughs> that's how it always is. Men, women always go harder than men in anything. Yo, bro, I appreciate you coming yeah, by. I'm about to I suppose I'm going to go pick up some money, but I'm about to end up at Whiskey Mistress. 